Good evening, Santa Monica, and welcome to the April 26, 2022 special meeting of the Santa Monica City Council. This will be our 430 meeting as a special meeting, and then we will move at 530 to a uh, regular meeting. Um, but uh, so we'll hold the pledge off till 530. But um, why don't we call the roll? Councilmember Nergrete? Here. Councilmember Brock? Here. Councilmember De La Torre? Here. Mayor Pro Tem McCowan? Here. And Mayor Hamelrich? Here. So we have a quorum, and uh, do we have any chips? We have one speaker. It's Denise Barton, and she has two minutes. Good evening. Let's look at ways the city and downtown Santa Monica Inc. previously looked for extra parking downtown. Many of you may be oblivious to this, but Gleam Davis, who was the liaison for downtown Santa Monica Inc. after Lane Politic left the city until the promenade and um, until the pandemic, including all the times her husband's employer's project came before downtown Santa Monica Inc. board. But what do you know? In the minutes of downtown Santa Monica Inc. for these meetings, there is no mention of Gleam Davis. Gleam Davis's presence, making it look even, dirt, even dirtier. Now back to the issue of parking downtown. I believe there's been twice that downtown Santa Monica Inc. board meetings have included the agenda item about trying to get additional parking from private property owners downtown. I believe it even came before the city council at least once. With the reasoning behind this being that people were unable to find parking, even with parking structure three open, and as a result, they left without patronizing the downtown area. So would that be the ultimate plan, to divert patrons from the promenade to Santa Monica Place or the retail at the Miramar, both which will have private security in comparison to the rampant crime happening on and around the promenade, while the city and downtown Santa Monica Inc. seem to be unwilling to discuss replacing the security ambassadors with the Sheriff's Department to make the area safer. Then as to the construction where Structure 3 is, as well as on top of the buildings on the promenade for affordable housing and retail. Do you not think that will be disruptive to businesses trying to serve customers? Or what about the lack of parking it will create for the promenade? Do the construction workers have an SUVs and trucks so that they have their tools and equipment they need, right? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barton. Um, so um, I, I guess now you'll read. Yeah, let me read Should the we items. Should we have done that before? I never, does it matter? Yeah, let me read the items that are, <laughs> yeah, I guess I should have called them first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's the closed sessions. We have an existing litigation at Santa Monica Housing Council, a nonprofit corporation, William T. Dawson, an individual, Irma Vargas, an individual versus the city of Santa Monica. You have another existing litigation. It's Joseph Hollins versus the Santa Monica Police Activities League. Another existing litigation. The name is Arash, and I'm, I'm sure I'm going to mess this up, Yaghabuda versus the city of Santa Monica. Another existing litigation is Soloway versus the City of Santa Monica, Kalini, Kareem Lee. Another one is Santa Monica Housing Council et al. versus the City of Santa Monica. Santa Monica, and next we have Santa Monica Bay, Bayside Owners Association versus the City of Santa Monica, California Coastal Commission, Court of Appeal, and the State of California, Second Appellant District Division 7. Um, we have one anticipated lit litigation. Then we have conference with the labor negotiator. The agency designated representative is city manager David White and chief people officer Lori Gentles. The bargaining units are the administrative team association, IBT, California, I'm sorry, IBT, California Teamsters Local 911, FEMA, Santa Monica Fire Executive Management Association. Uh, Santa Monica Firefighters Local 1109 IAFF, Municipal Employee Association, AFSCME Local 4819, it's the Management Team Association, the Public Attorneys Legal Support Staff Union, Public Attorneys Union, Santa Monica Police Officer Association, Smart TD, the International Association of Sheet, Metal, Air, Rail, and Transportation Division, Local 1785, Supervisory Team Association, and the Coalition of Santa Monica City Employees. And then the final is the public employee appointment is the city attorney. Um, 
and turning to the city attorney. So we'll come back at 5.30 and then. We will certainly try. But no, no, but then we'll get, then we'll come back, we'll convene the regular meeting and then, Correct. but then we expect to go back into closed session. At 5.30. Okay, so for right now, we'll be back at 5.30. Thank you.
Good evening, Santa Monica. We have come back from our closed session on our special meeting that we held at 4.30 p.m. And I'm going to turn to the city attorney and ask if we have any reportable action. No reportable action. Um, and so now I'm saying good evening, Santa Monica, and welcome. I'm sorry, what? You adjourn. Oh, I, I adjourn. Yes, okay, good, it, it's adjourned. Uh, yeah, so now we move to our regular meeting, and so good evening, Santa Monica, and welcome to the Tuesday, April 26th, regular meeting of the Santa Monica City Council. Um, now, uh, I have a special instruction. Please, if you're in the audience, turn your phones off or to vibrate so as not to disrupt the meeting. Thank you very much. And now, let's have the Pledge of Allegiance and uh, Councilmember De La Torre. Yes. Can I rise? Yeah. <laughs> I pledge I'm allegiance, ready to get. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now, Madam Clerk, will you please take the roll call? Sure. Councilmember Davis? Here. Councilmember Negrete? Here. Councilmember Brock? Here. Councilmember De La Torre? Here. Mayor Pro Tem McCowan? Here. And Mayor Hilmerich? Here. So um, now, uh, may we, do you mind uh, calling the closed session items? And do we have any chits? We do not have any speakers on closed session. Thank and you. Okay, so first we have an existing we have an existing litigation. Sir, you did not sign up your sheet. Uh, they haven't sent, I haven't been able to get a form to sign up as soon as you sir, can sir, if you want to speak, you would have to register. Okay. And it's past the point now. Uh, yes, I did register. Okay, we have, did you, did you register? And what's your name? Mr. Robinson, I don't have you, but come on up and have, are you speaking on closed session? I'm sorry, you're speaking. Okay, this isn't the time. This isn't the. This isn't no, so what we're asking for right now, so we are. So, sir, if you go up to our clerk and tell her what specific item you want to. I saw you pointing up to the screen. Okay, so let me so let me stop you. So go go back in. You can go back in the in the hallway, and there's a key. Eight eight. And there's a kiosk. Okay. Okay. Okay, sir, sir. This is not. Thank you. So I think you may need to go out into the hallway and register and with register the folks out speak. there to speak. So, they're out in the hall, right outside on the landing, and, there's a young lady and they'll give there. you a piece of paper to fill out. That will be oh, the thing you fill out, and then we'll right. welcome hearing from you. Oh, the kiosk. It is, it is working, sir. There's someone there that can assist you, yeah. and let them know that you want to speak on item 8A. That is the I see housing this. element discussion. I see, I see the items. So we have John Alley will be the first one, and that's on the city manager. Okay, so just let her know you want to sign up for 8A, and she can help you on the kiosk. Thank you, sir. Okay. So Okay, so now let's call um, our closed session. Okay, item. so we have an existing litigation, and it's the unfair practice charge, the administrative team association versus the city of Santa Monica, public employee relations board, and then we have another existing litigation. It is the Unfair Practice Charge Administrative Team Association versus the City of Santa Monica Public Employment Relation Board. And that's two separate cases. And as I said before, we have no request to speak. And I'm going to turn to our city attorney. 7 o'clock. So we should be back at 7 o'clock. We will see you at 7. Thank you all for being here.
Denise, are you ready? Everyone to quiet down because we are back from closed session and I'm gonna to turn to our city attorney and ask, do we have any reportable action? Yes, we do. We have item 1A and item 1B, conference with legal counsel, existing litigation. Litigation has been initiated formally pursuant to government code section 54956.9 D1, unfair practice charge, administrative team associates versus city of Santa Monica. Public Employment Relations Board, case number LA-CE-1495-M. 1B, conference with legal counsel, existing litigation. Litigation has been initiated formally pursuant to government code section 54956.91. Unfair practice charge, administrative team associate, City of Santa Monica, Public Employment Relations Board, case number LA-CE-1507-M. The report out is a settlement. The parties have agreed to settlement of both ATA cases with the following terms. Add four new job classifications to the ATA bargaining unit to be included in the exception-based budget for fiscal year 22-23. $50,000 lump sum payment. Apply salary wide rating to demotions in lieu of layoff. Effective from the date of execution of the settlement agreement through the duration of the successor MOU with ATA. Do I hear a motion to approve? Move settlement. Second. Oh. Second. Beat you. <laughs> oh my God. Moved by Davis, seconded by Brock. My Are name's you? up there. It's oh, okay. Seconded I by Negretti. I'm sorry. That's fine. Fast fingers. How's your name? Good. Um, everybody, remember your buttons. May we uh, have a roll call vote? I hate to tell you guys, but for this one, you won't be buttoned. I'll just call the roll. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Okay, that's okay. Council Member Parra. Oh, that's my phone. Yes. Councilmember Davis? Yes. Councilmember Negrete? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McCowan? Yes. Councilmember Brock? Yes. Councilmember De La Torre? Yes. And Mayor Himmelrich? Yes, so that passes seven to zero. And now we move on to um, our two items. So uh, first item is Commendation AYSO Western State Champion Santa Monica Storm, and we do have one speaker on this. Or do we have two, Mayor? Yes. Do we, Mary, did, do you want to hear the speaker first? Do you want me to, t uh, oh, oh, you aren't, she is a speaker. You're the coach. Um, Are you the coach? Yes. Well, before the coach gets up, we have a public speaker on this. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. So um, you guys stay there. It's fine. Or you can come in here in the well, but who's our? Um, it's Devon Ray Harris. Um, for two minutes. So. Mr. Uh, Mr. Harris, did you want to speak on this item? Mr. Mr. Harris, do you plan to speak? You have to come over to the mic over there for the public speech. No, Mr. Harris, I'm pretty sure that this isn't the item that you meant to speak on. Hold on, guys. What? Okay. Yeah, if it, yeah if it, it might be if it involves a company called uh, Venice Life Athletics, but it, it was changed, but it's just a different name under a tax ID and an EIN number, yes. No, this is a different item. This is about the soccer team, the Storm, that just won their championship. Oh, yeah, but mm -hmm. if, like I said, if it involves a company that was originally under Davon Ray Harris with a different tax ID and a different with a EIN number and someone else used a tax ID and EIN number, Without paying someone, yes, it does. Uh, I believe that that doesn't apply to this. So, oh, like, so maybe like you'll I come said. up again. Okay, yeah, thank you. I, like, okay, thank you. so. So let me yeah. congratulate these kids. Okay, thank you. So here you go. Now you're up. <laughs> so this is a commendation for AYSO Western State Champion Santa Monica Storm. So, you know what, we're gonna come down to you because I think, and Kristen, you wanna come with me? Because, um, what? She lost her microphone. That's okay, because I need to. Uh, I'm adjustable. Okay, so can everyone still hear me? Good, okay. Uh, 
So we want to acknowledge the extraordinary accomplishments of a Santa Monica AYSO soccer team, which calls itself the Storm. Would that be you guys? Yeah. <laughs> Santa Monica AYSO is the largest community youth sports organization in Santa Monica, serving over 1,500 kids. It is a nonprofit organization that is run entirely by volunteers. The Storm plays at the highest level of AYSO in the extra program, representing Santa Monica and Santa Monica against top soccer teams from other geographic regions. This Santa Monica team has remained undefeated the entire season. Over 20 games, yes, let's give them. <laughs> Starting last August and finishing on March 12th when they won the AYSO Western States Championship. The Western States Championship is the final finale of the AYSO soccer season, in which over 180,000 youth soccer players compete in six different states, including California, Arizona, Nevada, Oregon, Washington, and Alaska. Teams from all six states competed in several playoff rounds to earn one of only four spots for each age division at the Western States Championship. At the championships held near Gilroy, California, the garlic capital of California, on March 12th, the Santa Monica AYSO team won their, their semifinal game and then went on to the finals to defeat their Orange County opponent 4-2 in overtime to earn the title of Western State Champions. The team is made up of some special Santa Monica athletes. Most vote right Simon, Landon Bro Broy here, and pardon me if I butcher your names, guys. Jonah Craig, Ryan Drew, Daniel Friedman, Noah McLaurin, Alex Maringer, Taylor Moore, Michael Peterson, Jay Robbins, Leo Simon, and Auden Steiger. This team was led by two volunteer coaches, Eric Saltmarsh and Melinda Maringer. I assume you're Melinda, yes. Yeah. Hi, Melinda, who donated their time to teach these boys how to play like champions. The team trains right here on our local fields, including at JAMS and at the new Belmar field. Congratulations to Santa Monica AYSO and the Storm and the field advocates of Santa Monica. Yay. <laughs> And now, Melinda and Eric Saltmarsh, you're up, I guess, and uh, and you can take the mic here. But the other thing I want to show you, yeah, so let me show you. So each of you will be getting a commendation from the city of Santa Monica. Yes, one for each of you. There are 14, so we won't be giving them out. Um, but it will look like this, and you can have it framed and put it on your wall. And Kristen's going to hand it to your coaches, right? This is Mayor Pro Tem Kristen McCowan. And we are very proud of you. And I can tell you as somebody who played team sports in my youth that you will learn how to collaborate with other people and be better members of any team in life by doing this. So I think you all should be really proud. And here's your coach. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think you said it all. And I just want to thank the Honorable Mayor and this Honorable City Council for welcoming us and our team here tonight. Um, we're all very proud of you boys and how hard you worked to achieve this incredible accomplishment. And hopefully you guys, like the mayor said, have learned the lesson is when you work hard, you can achieve great things. So thank you very much and thank you very much to the City Council. Thank you.
So I'm standing here. So Mayor, before, before I go to the next one, I wanted to make an announcement that um, we had, we received some complaints that there was no audio. There is audio on YouTube. There's also audio on City TV. So just to, so, uh, so if I you guys are seeing. So I understand that people are having trouble with their audio, but um, we understand that there is audio on YouTube and, uh, and audio on City TV, yes. which on my TV is, I guess, channel 21. I don't know what yours is. So. <laughs> Or 16, 16 or 21. Um, and now uh, the next item, and can I have to So the next one is Proclamation Week, I'm sorry, Proclamation City Clerks Week, May 1st through the 7th, 2022. And we have one speaker, Denise Barton. Good evening. While I'm happy to celebrate the City Clerk's Week, I'm supportive and grateful for some of the employees in the, in the City Clerk's Office. I have grave concerns about the continued employment of Denise Anderson Warren at City Clerk. Um, according to the Transparent California, Ms. Anderson Warren's total pay with benefits was $307,686 in 2019. Ms. Anderson Warren is commonly known to be serving at the interest of the lobbyist group Santa Monica Forward instead of being a politically neutral public official for the city of Santa Monica. This is very concerning as in her role as city clerk, Ms. Anderson Warren is in charge of the elections. During the most recent election year, Ms. Anderson Warren interfered and lied about a submission by a group opposing one of the ballot measures. As far as I know, she was never disciplined for that. I'm informed that these have been, that there have been HR complaints filed against her, Ms. Anderson Warren, which were whitewashed. The city needs a highly skilled and ethical city clerk, not a plant within the city doing the bidding of a lobbyist group like Santa Monica Forward. The city council appoints and fires city clerks. I'm looking to change, to the change slate to be stewards of public funds and to replace the overpaid, underperforming, and unethical city clerk with one worthy of the tax dollars the city has to expend on the important position of city clerk. Ms. Anderson Warren should not be the clerk trusted to take care, to take the city through another election. Thank you. Uh, that was our only public speaker. Uh, and now let me read this proclamation and then um, I, I will call, a, and let me come down here and do it, okay? So we can stand here together. So, whereas the office of the city clerk, a time-honored and vital part of local government exists throughout the world, and whereas the office of the city clerk is the oldest among public servants, and whereas the office of the city clerk provides the link between the citizens, the local governing bodies and agencies of government at, all, at other levels, and city clerks have pledged to be ever mindful of their neutrality and impartiality, oh good, <laughs> rendering equal service to all. And whereas the city clerk serves as the information center on functions of local government and community, and whereas city clerks continually strive to improve the administration of the affairs of the office of the city clerk through participation in education programs, seminars, workshops, and the annual meetings of their state, provincial, county, and international organizations, and whereas it is most appropriate that we recognize the accomplishments of our office of the city clerk. Now, therefore, I, Sue Himmelrich, Mayor of the City of Santa Monica, on behalf of the members of the City Council, do hereby take great pleasure in proclaiming May 1 to 7, 2022 as City Clerks Week for the City of Santa Monica. And I want to express my appreciation to the clerk's office who 
I couldn't make it through a week without. So, <laughs> so there we go. So I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be brief. So I wanted to thank you guys on behalf of the city clerk's office and on behalf of my staff. Um, I just want you guys to realize how resilient they've been. Um, they've been completely ethical and they remain professional throughout this entire epidemic. Um, you guys know just from how difficult the meetings have been and that sort of thing. Um, but they stepped up, nobody complained the entire time. And so I just want to thank them and I want to make you guys aware of that is who runs the city clerk's office, really. Um, so we look forward to continuing to provide quality customer service for members of the public. Um, because we're not back to pre-COVID yet, we are, this year we're cutting back on the events that we do during city clerk week. So it's going to be a smaller scale, but we're still going to celebrate. Um, so we're coordinating with the local libraries providing coloring books um, that show an overview of what the city clerk's office does, what municipal clerks do. And it's sort of in a fun way. Um, we will be out there. So some of the initiatives that we'll be doing this year, because you'll see us out there, we always participate in voter registration drives. We um, create our own. We go to the high schools. So um, we do that. We get out in the community. We go to the farmer's market. Um, this year we'll be promoting um, the upcoming June primary. So we're working with the county on that. Um, so you'll see us out there. You'll see us coordinated with the county doing that. We also are getting ready for the upcoming nomination period for those of you that are interested in running for office. It will begin in July. Um, that's a big lift for us, but we're looking forward to it. And we learned some things through, um, during COVID that we will bring with us for this, for this upcoming year. Um, of course, we have our whole boards and commission trainings that we're gonna be doing. Um, we hopefully will be implementing a new agenda management program for those of you that sit up here. And our greatest gift, we hope, that we will soon get an electronic posting board. <laughs> so those are, just, <laughs> those are just a couple of the initiatives that we're working on. But we are doing, you don't see us a lot, but we are doing a lot behind, behind the scenes. And the amount of public records um, that we process is just is, is enormous. <laughs> So, City attorneys over here at the shaking. Thank you so much. No, we do appreciate it. The meetings have been a challenge. We know the election is going to be a challenge. So let's give it to our city clerk. Okay, so now to the next item. The next item is the proclamation. It's building and safety month. And we have no speakers on this. Okay, so I guess I'll... Yeah, come on up, building and safety. I know you guys are here because I met you already. I want all of you up here, every single one. And then I'll join you in a minute, but um, so these are our building and safety officers. We have here a variety of officers from our building and safety department, and let me read this proclamation. Whereas our city is committed to recognizing that our strength depends on the safety and essential role our homes, buildings, and infrastructure play both in everyday life and when disasters strike. And whereas our confidence in the resilience of these buildings that make, our, make up our community is achieved through the devotion of vigilant guardians, building safety and fire prevention officials, architects, engineers, builders, tradespeople, design professionals, laborers, plumbers, and others in the construction industry who work year-round to ensure the safe construction of buildings. And whereas modern building codes include safeguards to protect the public from hazards, such as wildland fires, I hope we don't have those here, and earthquakes, which we do have here. And whereas Building and Safety Month is an an opportunity to remind the public about the critical role of our community's largely unknown protectors of public safety. Our building and safety staff who assure us of safe, sustainable, and affordable buildings that are essential to our prosperity. 
And whereas Building and Safety Month encourages us all to raise awareness about planning for safe and sustainable construction, career opportunities in building and safety, understanding disaster mitigation, energy conservation, and creating a safe and abundant water supply to all of our benefit. And whereas the City of Santa Monica wants to recognize and honor the building and safety professionals all across the United States and bring awareness to the importance of building and safety to communities. Now, therefore, I, Sue Himmelrich, Mayor of the City of Santa Monica, on behalf of the members of the City Council, do hereby take great pleasure in proclaiming the month of May 2022 as Building and Safety Month. In the City of Santa Monica, I encourage all citizens to join me in this observance. And who's speaking for Building and Safety? I guessed it was you, Ariel. So, and here is this, right? Thank you. I'll leave thank it you. here for you, and thank you. Good evening, everyone. Ariel Sakaris. I'm the Building and Safety Division Manager. I just want to say thank you for acknowledging the Building and Safety Division, as well as uh, the profession generally. Um, it's a pleasure being here, and just want to say thank you. I also, um, I know you have many, you have other items to get to on the agenda tonight, but real briefly, I want to extend my gratitude and appreciation to Building and Safety staff. Um, we, they've. They've always, in my opinion, done, done great work, quality work, but over the past two years, as with everything, it's been extremely difficult. Uh, our work group is one of several work groups in the city that um, has been reporting to work every day, particularly the inspectors since day one have been coming to work and going to work sites and making sure that construction continues. The permitting staff has been back in the office for over a year now, every day, and it, um, it seems odd, actually, that we're praising people for physically reporting to work every day, but it's 2022. I guess that's that's where we're at. Um, no, so with that, um, that's all I have. And just, again, want to say thank you. I want to let you know that we have two Building and Fire Life Safety Commissioners here, Blair Calderhead and Timothy Katsouris, who used to be a senior plan check engineer with us. Um, our building officer, R.S. Sargian, is present. Another senior plan check engineer, Cameron Ravandi. We have uh, three inspectors. We have an, uh, the acting inspection supervisor, Jim Brewster. Uh, Combo inspector three, Steve Gobrio. Combo inspector three, Louis Vasquez. And we also have the president of the International Code Council, the Los Angeles Basin chapter. Um, sorry, I don't, Celine Sarkislu, am I pronouncing pronounce that correctly? with us tonight. So thank you again. Um, so, uh, do you guys want a picture? I mean, um, yeah, so come on back. Hold on, let's do it. Who's taking it? it. Oh, oh, Shannon, you're on it. Thank you. Oh, you're the official photographer. Yeah, yeah come back farther and that way. We'll kind of peek between the uh, short posts. <laughs> So, Mayor, next we have Mental Health Month proclamation, and we have no speakers for this. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the most proclamations we've done since I've uh, been here, I think, right? Four in a night. So now this is Mental Health Month. So let me talk about the proclamation for mental health months, and, and, and let me say, and um, uh, I just did a, uh, a quote for the papers tomorrow about this, but um, I, I wanna say that I lost my nephew, Charlie, 18 months ago. Uh, he was 21 years old and he shot himself in his car in a parking garage. 
And we had no idea. I have 15 nieces and nephews, now I have 14. Um, and so mental health awareness is, even for those who think we're aware, more important than we think. And I just have to say that you just don't ever expect it when it comes. And when it comes, it is a big hole in your family that you never expect. So on that note, let me read the proclamation. Whereas mental health is essential to everyone's overall health and well-being, especially as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic and mental illnesses are common and treatable. And whereas prevention is an effective way to reduce the burden of mental health conditions, and whereas with effective treatment, individuals with mental health conditions can recover and lead full productive lives. And whereas the city of Santa Monica is committed to supporting a community where mental health is prioritized and diverse paths towards recovery are celebrated. And whereas the city of Santa Monica invests in education and programs to enhance community awareness of and access to culturally competent mental health services and treatment options now and in the future. For people of all ages and racial and ethnic backgrounds, they're in supporting all persons to participate fully in civic and community life. And whereas the city council appointed the Santa Monica Disabilities Commission to advance awareness of disabilities, including mental and behavioral health in its planning, decision-making, and advisory activities. Whereas Mental Health Awareness Month is a time for community members, government, public, and private agencies, healthcare providers, businesses, and schools to recommend, uh, to recommit to supporting our communities by increasing awareness and understanding of mental health, reducing stigma, and making appropriate and accessible services available for all people to prevent and recover from mental illness. Now, therefore, I, Sue Himmelrich, Mayor of Santa Monica, City of Santa Monica, on behalf of the members of the City Council, do hereby take great pleasure in proclaiming May 2022 as Mental Health Awareness Month in the City of Santa Monica. And Alex Elliott, are you present? Great, thank you so much. So I'm now, this is uh, the chair of our Disabilities Commission, uh, Alex Elliott, who will say a few words about this and who will receive this proclamation. And thank you for being here. Thank you. Just take the mic. Uh, you're on, right? The screen, you're on. Hi, thanks the City Council for having me. Again, thank you for keeping the Disabilities Commission as a standalone. We really appreciate, we really appreciate working together to make our digital and our physical spaces accessible and continue to work together. I just wanna keep it uh, very brief. Um, I'm a psychiatric social worker by trade. I've, I've worked on the streets of Santa Monica for years. Um, and I've worked with people with all sorts of mental health challenges and when I think about recovery, I think about the three P's. It's, it's uh, people, place, and purpose. Simply, it's something to do, someone to love, and something to hope for. And if we're working towards that goal, I think um, we'll be a, a more he mentally healthy Santa Monica, and I look forward to working with you on that. And just a quick plug, we'd love to have more people join the Santa Monica Disabilities Commission. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, and thank you for being here. So next we, have, next we have item 2E, which is a city manager report, and we do have a speaker on this. It's John Alley. I'm sorry. Hold on, John. Madam okay. Clerk, I have... A slide presentation. Yes, hold on a um, City manager, in the last council meeting, my comment was not ma made available to the public. Your primary responsibility is to maintain safety for residents and workers in our city. There we go. Every other item on the agenda tonight is secondary. John, could you hold on a second? Sure. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to cost you time. But hold on.
because you sent him in a week, right? That's right here, yeah. Is that it? Okay. Thanks. City manager, you continue to keep the garage dumpster rooms open all night for our drug dealers, sex workers, homeless, taggers who sleep in and behind the dumpsters. You contribute to the crime, the assaults, the overdosers, overdoses, and the fires. You don't respond to me or to the businesses and residents even within 40 yards of those dumpster rooms. Your city maintenance workers don't understand. Some have been assaulted. You're dishonoring the homeless, residents, businesses, yourself. You don't respond to passionate doctors from our hospitals who have sent you letters informing you of the conditions for infectious diseases. Syringes, condoms, left behind knives, left behind tin foil that holds meth. It's not right. It's not compassionate. It's reckless. Please watch these images. And I ask Madam Clerk to focus the cameras so that the people at home can watch these. Well, we don't seem to see it working again. That's your two minutes. Thank you. Can you? Um, yes, please. Thank you. First, uh, Mayor, I want to thank you uh, deeply for sharing your story uh, aligned with the proclamation for mental health. I think it's really important that we have these conversations and share our stories for all of us to heal. So thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. I'm going to make a stark pivot <laughs> for a couple of uh, announcements. One is um, this Saturday uh, we'll be celebrating uh, at Virginia Avenue Park from 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock, our annual art and literacy festival. So obviously everyone is encouraged to come out and uh, enjoy with us. The theme this year is bugs, bugs, bugs. Not my favorite topic, but nonetheless, I know it will uh, absolutely enthrall uh, many of the children in our community. So again, this is one of many celebrations up and coming as we get through spring and into the summer. So you'll be hearing a constant stream of celebrations on the horizon. And then I wanted to share earlier today, uh, was lucky to celebrate with the mayor uh, this morning, uh, the swearing in of uh, four uh, police officers to our fine police department. Our department uh, is working incredibly hard uh, to fill their vacancies. We're up to uh, nine new officers in our department for this year, which uh, 
almost eclipses what we've done over the past two years. So uh, I've communicated to all of you and to the community our very keen intent and focus on filling our vacant positions. Our department is doing a tremendous job doing it, and it was just wonderful to be in the room this morning to not only acknowledge them, but yet another promotion of Lieutenant Cody Green. So just wanted to share that for the community and the council that we're working hard at it. Thank you. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Another well-oiled machine. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, does anyone have any questions of staff? Seeing none. Um, Madam Clerk, you wanna ask about travel? Yes, are there any council members who have uh, traveled, who have anything to report on travel since the last meeting? And this is city paid travel. Uh, council Member De La Torre. <clears throat> I know that uh... It, the uh, the report is mostly for travel that's that's the city pays for, but I do want to announce that I attended a conference. I applied for a scholarship. I attained the scholarship from the National Association of Latino Elected Officials, and we had a convening um, in uh, Chicago uh, from Wednesday to uh, Saturday, and um, it was around emergency preparedness. So talking about the impact of COVID, the impact of climate change, uh, what city, cities need to do, uh, to prepare, uh, met with leaders from uh, the city of Santa Ana, Ontario. A lot of Californians were there, but also people from uh, Chelsea. Uh, I met uh, uh, just a lot of elected officials sharing their struggles on their challenges. Uh, so this is something uh, that's nationwide, and I'm, I'm happy to report that the city of Santa Monica is doing a pretty good job considering everyone reported about all the good things they were doing to respond to COVID, and I checked off everything that they, that they did uh, and some. So uh, happy to report on that. Good for you, Oscar. That's good. Thank you for representing us there. Uh, is that it on travel? Great. So now, Madam Clerk, I guess we move to the consent calendar. Yes, so we'll go to the consent item. But I also want to note that in accordance with Charter Section 615, the adoption of all ordinances and resolutions shall be by reading of title only unless a council member present dissents. And so for the consent calendar, all items will be considered and approved in one motion, unless removed by a council member for discussion. And let me see how many speakers we have. Looks like we have two speakers, John Alley and Mr. Morgan. So I'm going to ask the speakers to line up on the wall over there. Mr. Is that Mr. Harris? Mr. Morgan. So I'm sorry. Uh, sir, what's your name? No, uh, no, the person standing at the podium. Yes. And um, are you here on something on the consent calendar, sir? Uh, there's an approval for proposed uh, uh, auction plan um, allocating federal community development block grants and home investment uh, partnership. Well, um, I was staying at uh, 1444 14th Street, uh, and the address is, is kind of changed right now. I guess it's 1344 right now, uh, whatever. But I, I guess this is my where I was staying. And uh, I had a, a block from a stairway order, but I don't know how I had a stairway order, what it was from something else. It was from Rite Aid. And uh, yeah, that that's probably where I was standing. The stuff I have in there was for my auction called A1 Auction, but I guess someone just sold my auction from that company, Bingo. So I don't know, um, I guess that's, I guess that's me. So yes, I'm trying to speak up for myself because uh, I got blocked out of not having a phone out of this community. Uh, I don't have a phone. Uh, blocked out of the main phone companies right here, the main banks right here. Uh, I need to be able to get my stuff and be able to need to do what I need to do for myself. That's, uh, these are my grants. Uh, that's all my stuff that's in that house. I bought those from my companies. I basically went to different stores and bought everything myself, did everything myself, came up with the companies myself, uh, so those were to fund my to fund my companies, H2O Entertainment, uh, A1 Auction, Venice Cycle Athletics and Apparel, uh, MC Photos, um, Carrie Davis Foundation, and uh, that's um, 
and it's one more company. But yeah, I came up with them all myself, and uh, I guess I was going to fund myself by doing different things, buying different things, and uh, doing it the way I was going to do it. But I guess I've been blocked out of the place I've been staying at, so I uh, I don't know. What, it's my first time coming to the meeting. I don't know what to talk so, about. So, sir, he, here's what would be helpful to us. If you uh, tell us your full name, and, and we'll get it down, and if you um, have something that has your name, and I, I get you Well, said, I haven't. For, like, the last couple years, like, maybe five to six years, and I haven't been able to get mail from them at all. Well, this uh, is what I'm going to ask you to do, okay? I'm going to ask you to leave with the clerk your name, address, and phone number, okay? Right well, I don't have basically any of those. Like I just said, I got kicked out the uh, the main phone companies, Cricket, T-Mobile. I, I didn't get no help there. I would call, ask for help. The, the people that govern the city didn't give me no help. I was trying to get a bank card. Uh, they didn't help me get a bank card. I had banks at multiple companies here, um, different places. And um, uh, I don't have a residence now because I had uh, somebody had gave me a stairway order from, I guess, where I was living. But I, I went to court the other day. I figured out it was a right aid. So, sir, let me just say that. So we're in the middle of a meeting, right? We've heard your comment, right? And, and why don't you leave your name with the city clerk, right? And, Who do and I need to leave my name for if I don't even have a phone number? Well, I, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, but we have to keep going on with our meeting, and, and this is something we can't do right here, right now. Um, but thank you. Mr. Alley. My remarks are for 13D, selection of. No, this is consent. This is different. So you want it for 13D? I'll I'm sorry, 3D. 3D. Okay, go regarding ahead. Regarding the security on the pier. Go ahead. Sorry. Staff has not made it clear why it is asking for an exception to the normal procedure of obtaining competitive bids except to say that they lack the time during the six-month period from June 1st, January 1st to June 30th, when they were supposed to conduct a competitive bid process on this term. The city code requires any and all contract services agreement over 250000 to be competitively bid. In the original contract award to Panther, there was no open bidding process. Three firms were contacted to assist with this contract. Why the snubs? Why the rush? Where's the transparency? Maybe Panther is the right firm. Maybe not. We don't know what the monthly payments are on the existing or the proposed renewal deals. We don't know the exact hours of operation that have been contracted. Staff has shirked their responsibilities. Staff had three months to complete the competitive bid process. Staff has failed each of you, our residents, and our businesses. We've already learned from the ambassador program on the Third Street Promenade and DTSM's secret business contracts that charging stakeholders for services the city should pay for then continuing to increase those fees over time invites trouble. Rushing through this means not enough thought and reason. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Alley. Uh, does that conclude our speakers? Um, does any council member wish to pull any uh, any of the consent items from the agenda, from the consent it's calendar? 3D. Uh, 3D? Yes. Okay. Uh, any others? So, 3A? Uh, so, council member De La Torre pull, pulled 3A and council member Brock pulled 3D. Uh, does one of you want to move the remainder of the consent calendar? I'll move the remainder. A second. Uh, moved by Brock, seconded by Negretti. Uh, may we have a roll call vote on the remainder?
Why don't you come up and speak now? Here, you come and you're going to have. Okay, sir, we're giving you two minutes like everybody else. Half, so you go. Quick. I'm so Steve let's Robinson. go I've for been it. Here. Thank God for that police officer over there. Great job we're doing. Hey, we understand your concerns. City Council, I've been standing here for 45 years as a, as a, as a resident of Santa Monica. Finally, I'm finally given that right. Uh, three months ago by Ocean Park Community Center, a failing system that has failed everybody who donates to this place. I've been here for 45 years. That's my question. Why have I been here for 45 years? Is it the housing? Is it discrimination? I've been on that when I made $1.35 an hour. But still, hats off to the police. And, sir, they're working behind the scenes on this homeless problem because I've been homeless for 45 years. I know every person that comes up on that homeless board. And I feel like I told them this years ago, we need to house our, we need to police ourselves first. We need to let who comes in the town at Santa Monica. We do carry an upset of class that we carry with us and pride for our tours. It makes this work. We can make this place a way better place than it has been. We just need to listen to the guy who's down low, you know. I understand your concerns, sir. You're right. That is some places that we need to work for. But that officer there, I see him at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm here for women and children. That, that was a great thing this day. But somebody needs to look and investigate this Ocean Park Community Center, which now people are concerned about their paychecks. They're, they're not helping this situation. They're stealing from me. I like my $6,000 on my phone from Cyber Bob County Court, but they stole my stuff away. And here I am growing. Chef at Cheesecake Factory. Love Santa Monica. Greatest city in the world. Thank you, God. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. You had your two minutes. Uh, I I'm sorry. Can we have the motions again? Uh, yeah, we had three. Oh, uh, yes. So we had a uh, uh, motion by uh, Brock, seconded by Negretti, right? And are we ready for the roll call vote? Sorry. Okay, you guys, we can vote on this one. <laughs> okay, so let everybody vote. <laughs> and Council Member Para? Yes. Council Member Davis? Yes. Council Member Negrete? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McCowan? Yes. Council Member Brock? Yes. Council Member De La Torre? Yes. And Mayor Hemmelrich? Yes, and that passes seven to zero. Bill, push your button, please. So let's do um, item 3A, which was pulled by Council Member De La Torre, and it's approval of the proposed fiscal year 2022 23 one year action plan allocating federal communi community development black block. Grant, CDBG, and Home Investment Partnerships Act Program, Home Entitlement Grant Fund. I just have a real simple question that staff can answer. Uh, why, why is it that the Pico Neighborhood Association is not, uh, not reached out to for, for input into the plan? Uh, thank you for the question, Council Member. I'm Mark Amrell with the Housing and Human Services Division. Uh, we do send notice to all neighborhood associations of the opportunity to comment on any proposed projects for the action plan, including the PNA. But I, I see that you, you meet with specific nonprofit organizations, and I just want to make a recommendation that in the, in the future that, that we reach out and we meet with that organization because it's the only elected body in, in, in um, a part of the city that, according to the report, uh, represents the highest uh, poverty section of the city. So I just want to make sure that we, we make that happen next time around. Thank you. You're moving the item? Y yes, and uh, I'd like to move the item for approval. Now, here a second. Second. Uh, yeah, moved by De La Torre, seconded by Brock. I'll get you the next time, Christine. Uh, may we have a roll call vote? <laughs> All right. I don't know why it's not happening, but. <laughs> Council Member De La Torre? Yes. Council Member Brock? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McCowan? Yes. Council Member Negrete? Yes. Council Member Davis? Yes. Council Member Para? Yes. And Mayor Hemmelrich? Yes, and so that passes seven to zero. And Next nobody thing. needs, no buttons. Okay, and. Next item is item 3D, approval of contract modification with California Panther Security to provide security services related to peer vending. And Council Member Brock pulled that item. There have been another, a number of questions from the community about this exception to bid process. Uh, I think California Panther has done a, a really good job uh, so far of uh, helping security at the Santa Monica Pier. And I will, I obviously, well not obviously, I support their extension. However, 
there are questions from various members of the community and some of the neighborhood organizations about why there could not be a competitive bid process for this vital security service. So I'd like to, on behalf of the community, I'd like to hear where we are in this and what happened. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, good evening, council members. My name is Cheryl Shavers. I'm the senior administrative analyst for the Code Enforcement Division. <clears throat> so um, initially, uh, we there was a contract with um, Allied Security and Public Works, and we wanted to contract with them, but they wouldn't contract with us, so we had to piggyback on their contract um, because of the urgency as to what was going on on the pier. So while Allied Security was at the pier, um, we went out to get three bids, um, Allied Security, CA Panther, and Intercon Security, which have all done business and are vendors here with the city of Santa Monica. So we reached out with them based on the urgency to get the bids and um, it was approved for us to go under the city manager's authority for less than 250,000. So that's what we did. However, this is an extended, a new contract or an extension of the contract, which is over 250,000. So I think what residents have been asking the last few days is if we had gone to bid, would we could we have got a better deal from California Panther? And did we not? I think this extension starts when June thirtieth. Yes, it's quite so. We've had six months. So the question begs: Could an RFP been done during that time, or was this absolutely? Did we negotiate the best deal we could? to extend California Panther? Um, I believe that we did because we worked with the city attorney's office, we worked with the city manager's office and procurement, and it, this decision was reached that we would um, extend um, this contract due to uh, the, um, we had the, um, the study session and council asked us to move forward and recommended that you know we move forward and continue. So that's that's what we we are doing. Could I ask if David, do you have any other things that can add clarification to this? Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to. So Thank you so much. You're, you're welcome. So, um, in terms of timing, when uh, we went to council in February with the study session, we got direction to continue with security services. Um, in order to uh, continue that work. Um, and get the best possible price. Our staff went out, reached out to three different firms. Panther came out to be the lowest price. We are asking for an exception to the bidding process so that we don't have any gap in security services between now, the end of the fiscal year, and next year, because we understand the urgency of the work we're doing at the pier. Um, so that's the basis for the exception to the competitive process. Do I, I sent you, I forwarded you a couple of letters from residents. Um, is there any validity to the exception to contract rule or exception to RFP rule that they're saying? In other words, should we no we normally would go out for RFPs. I understand this is an, a definite exception, and I want the security at the pier to be continuous. And I encountered two California Panther uh, representatives at the uh, top of the pier on Sunday morning. They were both attentive. They were both doing a good job. They were both courteous. So uh, I just, I'm not opposing the extension. I'm asking, I think, if the residents have any um, validity to their statements or their comments that normally there should be a public process that's more defined. Yeah, in, in an ideal world, yes, a contract of this magnitude, we would go out for a competitive process. Um, but like I said, the reason why we went to a very specific section of the exception process was because of the urgency of this request and need. But yes, a contract of this magnitude ideally should go out through a process, should get an RFP done, and should be competitively bid. How long would that take, David? Yeah, that's 
Oh, that, um, I can't give you a specific time frame, but just to walk through the various steps that would be done, right? So obviously first staff would uh, draft an RFP and that would be done within the department and then that would have to go through procurement to get posted. Then that have to be publicly available for a reasonable period of time in order to be bid upon. Then the RFP would have to be evaluated. So you know each one of these steps, you could think of four to six weeks to eight weeks. Then once they're evaluated and scored and a recommendation made, then they have to prepare an agenda report and that agenda report goes through just a reasonable process, right? Gets reviewed by finance, city attorney's office, right? All the correct checks and balances. So we would have missed, we would have had a so six gap months in from now, we might have a security firm at the Correct, pier. and we, we would have lost the security presence while we're in the height of spring and summer. That's very important for residents to understand that we had to have continuous coverage. And I believe the city is comfortable that California Panther was the lowest bid originally and will continue to be, we, we did not give them a raise. They're at the same rate going forward, just an extension of months. I'll defer to staff on, oh, she, that's yeah, correct. nodding ahead, yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for okay. that. All right, I'll move adoption. I just wanted to make a comment to note, I won't move. being involved that Allied also had staffing issues. They, they did. And they that had. created a real problem where we were without security, so. You're correct, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so. Okay, I'll move adoption. Moved by Brock, Second. seconded by De La Torre. Let's have a roll call vote. Council Member Parra? Yes. Council Member Davis? Yes. Council Member Negrete? Yes. Mayor Pro Tim McCowan? No, yes. Yeah. Council Member Brock? Yes. Council Member De La Torre? Yes. And Mayor Himmelrich? Yes, yeah, so that passes seven to zero. And that concludes our consent calendar, I believe, and we're on to continued items. Yes, so we're on, so the first one is appointment to one unscheduled vacancy on the Disabilities Commission for a term ending June 30th, 2022. And um, are you running this, Madam Clerk? I, I open the floor to nominations. Clara Hendler. Clara Hendler. And that was Council Member Davis? Yes. Yes, Council Member Davis. Uh, anyone else? So, uh, Clara Hendler, uh, we on, we're only filling one, is that right? Uh, Clara Hendler by acclamation? Yes. Okay, so Clara Hendler by acclamation, um, Madam Clerk. Next, we have the appointment to one unscheduled vacancy for the Planning Commission for a term ending June 30th, 2025. And I open the floor to nominations. Josh Hamilton. Samuel Token. So we have Josh Hamilton and Samuel Token. Uh, do we have any chits, by the way, on this? Because I thought I saw Josh. Hold on a second. Oh, okay. We do have two. Hmm? So, um, yeah, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm seeing so Josh and Elizabeth Vandenberg. Are they here? Uh, yes. Uh, so, yes. Well, the speakers, yes. So, uh, Mr. Hamilton, um, you're first, and Elizabeth Vandenberg, but. I don't see her. And, and, There you go, you're up. You. Um, nice to see you. Good to see you too. Uh, good evening, council, member and, council members and mayor. Uh, my name is Josh Hamilton. I'm one of the applicants for the vacant seat on the Planning Commission. Um, it's a pleasure and it's on, and an honor to be here with you guys tonight. I first wanna just say thank you for your service. I know this is a volunteer position that all of you guys take on, so just thank you. Um, I also wanna thank each of you for meeting with me over the course of the last month. Um, I, I'm honestly amazed that you could find the time in your schedules to, to meet. And thank you for your kind email last night, Councilmember Parra. Um, it means a great deal to me, regardless of how this vote goes, that we have a council that is attentive and careful to each of your appointments. So thank you. 
Um, I'm approaching this opportunity with uh, no personal agenda. I have no personal ax to grind in this situation. This is simply an opportunity for me to serve and hopefully play my part as one of the many caretakers here um, for the city of Santa Monica. Um, I come to you also as a member of the uh, Santa Monica Housing Commission. Um, I also come with over 20 years of experience in affordable housing. Um, I currently lead a team that provides early stage financing for a range of affordable housing types, including transitional housing for people transitioning from homelessness all the way up to middle income housing. Um, as a member of the Housing Commission, I understand the obligation and the responsibility of serving on a public commission and, and the amount of work that is required. So uh, how we work with a changing world while maintaining our unique neighborhoods here in Santa Monica is a challenge I'm ready to take on. And I firmly believe that a diverse housing stock translates into a diverse city. And I look forward to working with uh, the members of the commission if I'm the Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. And uh, I think that, um, I, I think you may be out, no, you can sit down now, I'm sorry, thank you. Um, I, I don't, whoa. Now that's a good <laughs> Hello. Okay, we're back to normal. Uh, okay, so now, um, uh, I guess we're ready. Oh, uh, Ms. Vandenberg, I get, was she on? Uh, yes. So there she is, Elizabeth Vandenberg. Are you speaking on the appointment to the Planning Commission? Good, well, come forward because you're up. And, and you can take your mask off if you want, but you don't have to. Uh, yeah, I'll turn it on. 837 oh. Lincoln Boulevard. I urge the council to approve Samuel Tolkien to the Planning Commission. He has the appropriate background, skills, and abilities, and I hope you do nominate him for that position. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vandenberg. And I guess now that we've had our public comment a little out of order, we're there. Not, right, we have um, two names, right? Hamilton no, right. and Tolkien, right? We have Hamilton and we have Tolkien. So when I call your name, tell me which one you want to vote for. Council Member De La Torre. So it's uh, Hamilton or Tolkien? Tolkien. Council Member Brock? Tolkien. Mayor Pro Tem McCowan? Josh Hamilton. Council Member Negrete? Tolkien. Council Member Davis? Hamilton. Council Member Para? Tolkien. And Mayor Hamilrich? Um, Hamilton um, and Josh, thank you for what you've done on the Housing Commission, but now let me change my vote to Mr. Tolkien. Same. And uh, yeah, Council Member McCowan changed her vote. Council Member Davis is not, so there we go. Uh, so Mr. Tolkien, welcome to the Planning Commission. The next one we have is appointment of one unscheduled vacancy to the Public Safety Reform and Oversight Commission for a term ending June 30th, 2025, and we have Mr. Craig Miller speaking on this item. Live and in person. Good evening, Mr. Miller. So it's a pleasure, and don't feel bad, Mayor. I haven't seen you in a tie for about three years. Okay. And we all have trouble with feedback sometimes, so don't, don't feel badly about, oh, I don't. about what just happened. Uh, good evening, distinguished uh, city leaders. Thank you for your service to our city. Let me also take a moment to thank the dedicated members of the Santa Monica Police Department. They're here tonight and throughout our city streets keeping us safe. During our uh, searing summer of 2020, um, I, like you, saw many urgent handmade signs carried overhead by many earnest people. And I, like so many men, like so many Santa Monicans, was deeply moved. One sign that touched me and that called out to me not to be forgotten is in fact, and in total, the reason I came here tonight, which is to share it with you. Uh, it was a sign carried by a black mother who had lost her son to police violence. And it read, remember us when we're not trending. My name is Craig Miller. I'm a 38-year-old resident, 38-year resident <laughs> of Ocean Park. 
Uh, I'm also one of only three openly gay men serving as a commissioner in this fine city, and I thank you for the opportunity. I'm here tonight as one committed to social justice to urge that a black man committed to police reform and civilian oversight be appointed to the first of two vacancies on the PSROC currently before the council. Many gay, transgender, brown, Asian, Native American people have experienced the iron boot of repression manifest as errant policing in America, but none more, none more than black men. As one who longs to be proud of my city, as one who is striving to make Santa Monica's new Public Safety Re Reform and Oversight Commission live up to its name, I respectfully request that we re Thank you, Mr. Miller. So, um, are, do we have to, no, I'm sorry, I'm not talking to the, no. Uh, so, thanks, see you later. Uh, so, do we have two vacancies or one? one more. We have one that's been advertised. So oh, and, and there will be, be another at a, at a later time. Okay, thank, I just wondered because he referred to two. And, uh, yeah, okay, so. So, Mayor, let's open the floor for nominations. Okay. And remember, it's one seat. Dante Harrington. Harrington. Okay. Paul Wendemore. Okay. We have Harrington. Is that correct? We have a long list. Sorry, you guys. And I'm sorry, who did you give Council Member Brock? Who did you nominate? Uh, Paul Wendemore. Are there any other nominations? Okay, so we have Harrington and Winnemore. When I call your name, please tell me which one you want to vote for. Councilmember Para. Ah. So it's Harrington and Winnemore that are the. Or did somebody else want to nominate somebody else? One. We have another one. Uh, one more. Council Member Davis. Harrington. Council Member Negrete. One more. Count, I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Tem McCowan. Harrington. Council Member Brock. One more. Council Member De La Torre. Harrington. Mayor Hemmerich. Harrington. So, uh, Dante Harrington, welcome to the Public Safety uh, Reform and Oversight Commission. I changed my vote to support his. Yes, yes. So, uh, Councilmember Negretti switched to Harrington. Um, I'll switch as well, as did Councilmember Parra. I'll, I'll also switch. As did Councilmember Brock. So, uh, uh, Mr. Harrington, you now have unanimous support in the City Council. Congratulations. Uh, okay, and um, so Mayor, uh, now we go to item 6A. Ah, uh, the centerpiece of the evening. Right? We have quite a few speakers on this. So it's introduction and first reading of an ordinance amending Santa Monica Municipal Code section 9.08.020 and appeals of Planning Commission's denial of two conditional use permits to allow meal and alcohol <coughs> service to the general public at the Oceana Hotel's existing restaurant. And um, Mayor, did you want to do the ex parte communication now? Uh, yes. Do we have any ex parte disclosures on item 6A, the Oceana? This is since our, we had our disclosures, so I believe this would be uh, any, and yes. Yeah, so we did disclosures when we heard this before. Now it's coming back. So I'm assuming that the disclosures that have to be made tonight are for any contact since the first hearing, but is that wrong? You may wish to do any, this is a de novo hearing um, due to the settlements. You may wish to do just any ex parte communications that you have had since since the appeal was filed. Since the appeal, okay. 
Oh, since the appeal of the matter. So basically what, what we're asking you to do is repeat any contacts you have from the beginning of our consideration of this, not since, so, so the disclosures you made the first time you need to make again, and then any additional disclosures. And I can start because, what is the dinging? Do we, is it? We're doing the Oceanic. Okay, so I, other than staying at the property about 15 years ago and walking by it virtually every day and talking and reading the correspondence we've received, I've had no ex parte contacts. Well, I'll go next because I'm easy. I've had no ex parte contacts. I've read the entire file and all the comments submitted in connection with it, but I haven't spoken with anybody about it. I had one meeting at the Oceana to meet Mr. Lippman. We did not have food or beverage and briefly discussed the plans that they had planned to do at the Oceana. I disclosed this last time that I met with Mr. Lippman and the gentleman to his left, right, left. Sorry, I'm really bad. Like, I can't say the direction if I'm, it's so weird. His left. His left. And I don't remember the date, though, and I just tried to pull it up and I couldn't find it. So it's in the record from the last time. And then Mr. Lippman and I had a phone call. I'm showing that it was on, I'm showing January 19th, but that doesn't seem right in my calendar. So it was, it was at some point between the last time and this time. I just, for whatever reason, I can't pull up the date. Thank you. Council Member Brock. I have on Friday, November 12th, I had a phone call with them on November 11th. I met with the Oceana Hotel neighborhood people on January 7th. I talked to him very briefly by telephone. And I can't find right now the earlier time. It may have been in September, July. I had breakfast there. Thank you. And I, unfortunately, that's not coming up on my calendar right now. But it would be on the, I disclosed it on the original ex parte. Thank you. Nothing since Friday, January 7th. January 7th? Okay. Council Member De La Torre? Yes, I reported that I did meet with Mr. Lippman and the gentleman to his right or left, depending on which way you're looking. And so we did, we initially talked about the plan. And then since after the vote, I met with Mr. Lippman on March 31st to discuss resident concerns and mitigations for some of the concerns that residents had raised. Thank you. And, yep, Council Member Parr. So I tried to look it up as well. And only one thing came up. So I think my original, when I first met Mr. Lippman, I met him on September 1st, 2021. I know that I had a phone call with him after the last, no, I had one, I think, before the last appeal, I believe, and then afterwards. And then I had one, I had a phone call with him last night. And that was it. Was it last night? Yeah, it was last night. Jeez, I don't know. Seems like so long ago, right? It's too much. Okay, so that is the ex parte disclosures. And now I think we are ready for our staff report. Good evening, Mayor and Mayor. Do we have a clicker? Oh, I'm sorry, his mic. Oh, I clicked on the wrong button. There you go.
Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Hemorrhage and Council. My name is Rather Duong. I'm an associate planner with the City Planning Division. Uh, I will be pre presenting item 6A before you tonight. Uh, I know the staff report contains a lot of information, including background information uh, relating to this project, but uh, the purpose of my presentation is to provide you some highlights uh, of this proposal before you. This is a proposal by the Oceana Hotel that involves three applications, a tax amendment and two conditional use permit applications associated with the hotel existing on-site restaurant. These applications were considered by the Planning Commission on June 9, 2021, uh, which did not receive a positive recommendation and were subsequently uh, denied. So tonight, as a result, Council is considering the proposal once more as appeals and as a, a de novo hearing. The essence of the Oceana Hotel request is to extend its existing meal and alcoholic beverage services to the public in its on-site restaurant. Due to its residentially zoned property, which prohibits the establishment of a publicly accessible restaurant, the proposal requires a tax amendment in which staff is recommending a new CUP review process, as well as two conditional use permit application in order to open the restaurant to the public and modify the existing alcohol CUP that uh, is currently uh, active for the Oceana Hotel. Based on the proposal, staff is recommending that council adopt it, that council adopt the determination that the proposal for the Oceana Hotel to open its restaurant to the general public is exempt from CQA guidelines section 15301 class one for existing facility to introduce first reading ordinance amending the zoning ordinance under a tax amendment which establishes a new CUP process and requirement. Uh, three, grant both appeals and approve two conditional use permits and finally approve the statement of official action. It should also be noted that both conditional use permits, if approved, would only become valid, valid if uh, the tax amendment is approved also. The proposal also highlights a number of key issues for council to consider. One, whether or not the tax amendment adequately balances various goals in promoting the city's economic recovery efforts, support a complete neighborhood, and create a public hearing process to hear and gather input from the community. Second, the appropriateness of the existing, uh, the appropriateness of extending the existing hotel guest only meal and alcohol beverage services to the general public. And finally, the effectiveness of the recommended condition of approval as a way to mitigate potential impacts. The Oceana Hotel is located at 849 Ocean Avenue on a zone that, on a property that is zoned R3. The site was originally developed as a three-story apartment building in 1957, and in 1958, the building was converted into a hotel when it was a permitted use within that zone. Today, there are a total of 70 guest rooms. Over a span of many years, the hotel remains a continuous use, but the underlying zone has changed along with associated regulation that resulted in the hotel being identified as a permitted use, a legal non-conforming use, and an allowed limited use as, permit, as explained in attachment H. The corner site fronts Palisade Park and the ocean beyond, but surrounded on three sides by all three zoning districts, to the north, south, and to the east. Uh, and uh, these properties are developed generally with apartments and condominium buildings. The property is within the Mil Wilmont neighborhood, considered to be one of the densest residential neighborhood in the city. These photos illustrate the existing site context surrounding the hotel property, as well as the complementary scale and design of buildings within this neighborhood. These, these three story, these three multi-story buildings are immediately adjacent to the Oceana Hotel on the north, south, and east sides. The building is generally constructed to the property lines with landscape planters along the front and side. The primary pedestrian entrance is from Ocean Avenue, while the rear alley access provides entrance to the garage. The building is designed in a courtyard style with a punch opening in the center, 
for pool and outdoor out, common outdoor spaces. All guest rooms around the courtyard and the common outdoor areas. The existing restaurant dining room is located at the front of the uh, hotel next to the lobby and the outdoor patio is in the courtyard as identified here uh, labeled in red. Entrance to the restaurant and access to the outdoor dining patio are in, internally located and can only be accessed from the courtyard with no openings facing the street or its neighbors. This courtyard design and placement of the restaurant seems beneficial in that guest rooms around the public and restaurant spaces essentially creating a buffer around the most potentially uh, noisiest area of the hotel, shielding potential noise impacts from reaching adjoining property and public, public right away. On this slide, I wanted to provide some more detail of the requested applications. Tax Amendment 20 ENT-0236 intends to amend SMMC section 9.08 to require a new CUP in order for an existing legal non-conforming hotel restaurant located in the R2 or R3 zones to extend its meal service to the public. Conditional use permit 21 ENT-0090 is the new CUP application required by the proposed tax amendment to establish a publicly accessible restaurant on the hotel property. And finally, conditional use permit 20 ENT-0237 is required to amend the existing CUP approved in 1996 to extend that alcohol service to the general public consistent with meal service. The proposal would amend a multi The proposal would amend the multi-unit residential district land use regulation to require CUP to open the restaurant to the public as a limited use provided certain criteria are met. One point worth noting is that the tax amendment is not intended to change the underlying classification of the hotel or motel use within the R2 or R3 zone as a prohibited use. In reviewing the overall proposal, staff recommends a new discretionary process, in this case a CUP, as a way to fully vet public outreach and public hearing process for a non-conforming hotel to request changes. This process allows for public participation that facilitates formulations of appropriate condition of, of approval to mitigate potential impacts. Under the proposal, there are three criteria, criteria a legal non-conforming hotel restaurant must meet in order to apply for this conditional use permit. One, that the hotel is established as of January 1st, 1995. Two, that the, condi that the conditional use per permit on site for on-site alcohol service to hotel guests and their visitor was approved prior to July 23rd, 2015 and that the existing restaurant prepares meal in an existing, re in a, in an existing kitchen for on-site consumption during operating hours for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and that it is ancillary, and the ancillary restaurant use has exist existed prior to July 23rd, 2015. The Oceana Hotel meets all three criteria. The hotel was established, it's a nine, was established in 1958, and there is an existing CUP, alcohol CUP that was approved in 1996. And finally, there's an existing on-site restaurant serving meals to order within an existing kitchen for consumption on a premises that has been in existence for more than 15 years. Criteria two and three emphasize the incremental and modest nature of the expansion of both the meal and alcohol services to the general public since such amenity already exists on the premises for hotel guests. In analyzing the restaurant CUP application within the context of the surrounding neighborhood, and as heard from neighbors, a number of, of potential impacts were identified, such as noise from the patrons, 
competition for parking on surrounding streets, and commercial intrusion into the neighborhood. The new CUP intends to address those concerns in a public forum, as well as provide the ability to mitigate impacts through condition of approvals. As far as, far as concerns over noise, the design of the building and location of the, rest of the restaurant help mitigate noise from impacting residential neighbors by facing the court by facing the courtyard and with and with a waiting area located in the lobby that eliminates outside queuing and waiting. The floor plan shows the layout of the dining room as well as dining patios area located in the courtyard, including the square footage and seat count and the poignant and the point of entry to the restaurant. The combined restaurant space is 1,556 square feet and provides a seating capacity of 67 seats. The path of travel and point of entry for hotel guests and restaurant guests is through the main entrance from Ocean Avenue and into the lobby, which also serves as the restaurant waiting area. Ensuring that no waiting or queuing takes place on the exterior of the building, entry to the restaurant and patio is through the lobby and into the courtyard indicated by the red arrows. As a side note, the hotel does not offer conference, conference rooms or host conferences. As for parking and circulation, the hotel provides 66 parking spaces in a subterranean parking garage. Two park Two parking studies conducted in, nine, in 2006 and 2015 during pre-pandemic time concluded that on-site parking is generally underutilized at the hotel, even when the hotel is near or at 100% occupancy. The decrease in the re reliance on on-site parking may also be explained by the popularity of ride-hailing services such as Lyft and Uber. Also, there are a number of preferential parking districts located directly south and southeast of the hotel that would prevent restaurant guests from parking on local streets. Nonetheless, potential impacts from noise, traffic, circulation concerns were raised and prompted a number of recommended conditions for council to consider, which will be discussed later. These photos show the interior design and layout of the restaurant and patio dining area south of the pool deck. The restaurant entry is from the courtyard and the outdoor dining area is buffered by guest rooms and help contain potential noise to within the property. The hotel has an existing alcohol CUP as I uh, shared with you earlier from 1996 so that alcohol can be served to guests and their visitors in guest rooms and common areas on the hotel property. The existing license will be retained. The alcohol CUP amendment would also, would allow the extension of the alcohol service in tandem with meal, meal service to the public, which aligns with the restaurant CUP under a different license type, which is light type number 47. Again, the extension of alcohol, alcohol service to the public is contingent on council approving the tax amendment and the restaurant CUP. At the June 9, 2021 meeting, uh, hearing before the planning commission, the planning commission and the community were divided with about equal support and opposition of the proposal. The commission highlighted a number of issues such as appropriateness of CEQA exemption, question of spot zoning and policy discussion on expansion of a non-conforming use in a residential zone, just to name a few. The community highlighted a number, of point, a number of points of view for and against the proposal as well, such as noise, traffic, and commercial creep into the resident, residential zone, as well as applauding the proposal as a benefit to creating a walkable community resulting in a local serving use and an expansion that will facilitate economic recovery. 
In its denial of both the CUP, the Planning Commission expressed reservations for long-term implications of the proposed use in the neighborhood and difficulty in achieving a balance between realizing a policy goal for a complete neighborhood while protecting the existing neighborhood. For its part, the applicant appealed, believing that there is ample evidence to support the proposal and that the denial will the, the, the denials were not supported by appropriate findings. As, as such, council consideration of the hearing tonight is essentially a, a, a brand new hearing. Based on st staff analysis of the project, coupled with concerns expressed by the community, a number of recommended con operational conditions are proposed for consideration by council, including hours of operation, uh, the availability of valet service, and that the uh, restaurant operates as a full service restaurant, including uh, prohibition on uh, a separate bar within the restaurant, along with uh, other considerations such as uh, alcohol service related to meals and limitation on special and private events, and so on and so forth, which we'll discuss, discuss at length in the staff report. In addition to staff uh, recommended condition, the Planning Commission offered a number of revised conditions, placing further limitations on operating hours, expand valet service to bicycle and other modes of transportation, and require for a multi-year compliance review, as well as deletion of condition prohibiting private events. The applicant is in agreement with these changes. In response to recent comment, comments about the hotel operation and noise from the public, the applicant has offered additional modification to some planning commission modified condition, including the addition of a new condition. And here are some of those uh, applicant proposed changes. And that includes the hours of operation ending at 10 a.m. on Friday and Saturday. Originally, that was proposed to end at 11 p.m and also uh, a change in the delivery uh, time from 10 to 4 p.m. Previously, that was proposed from 7 to 10. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, that was previously proposed from 9 to 6 p.m. And finally, this is the new condition that was offered by the applicant is that for any members of the general public arriving by car to the restaurant after 7 p.m., the carports located adjacent to the north garage entrance will be used first before taking before parking spaces in the garage to minimize the use of the garage door to access parking after 7 p.m. As you heard that uh, there were concerns about the noise generated from the opening and closing of the garage door. As far as neighborhood compatibility, the Oceana Hotel is a long-standing entity within the Wilmont neighborhood, spanning through a number of zone changes that were intended to support this hospita hospitality business while protecting the neighborhood surrounding it. Through the years, the hotel has for the most part been a good neighbor and quick to address any complaints. For this reason, the site-specific operational condition recommended for the current proposal are intended to protect the neighborhood while allowing the on-site restaurant to benefit the community as a local serving, walkable dining destination, which lends to consistency with the loose. Further, a number of goals and policies are highlighted here that supports the project consistency with the loose in creating, in creating a local serving use within easy walking distance and in, and in allowing small scale retail in a low medium and high density residential neighborhood. The hotel is located in a medium density residential neighborhood. So staff also conducted environmental analysis and determined that the proposal to open the hotel restaurant to the public is exempt under uh, class one of section 15301 for existing facility. Staff also wanted to note that uh, this exemption class 
that there are no exceptions to the use of the class of the class one exemption exemptions such as unusual circumstances. So essentially class one exemption for existing facility in particular to the proposal uh, in this case does not involve construction or expansion of the existing building would not result in any proposed or future expansion of the existing kitchen dining room or seating capacity indoor or outdoors. Proposal utilizes all existing features and functions of existing of the existing restaurant, kitchen, and wait staff. And finally, the proposal would not increase restaurant and seating capacity beyond the limits of the existing restaurant under the plan submitted for review with this application. For the tax amendment, two findings are required and can be made in the affirmative to support the proposal for its consistency with the general plan and loose under a number of goals and policies that support local serving uses that serve the daily needs of residents by allowing small scale retail to exist in neighborhoods while also protecting and preserving the character of that neighborhood. And to that end, staff also wanted to say that affirmative uh, findings can also be made in support of uh, the conditional use permit application under consideration by the council as well. So based on uh, the information provided to uh, council in the staff report and my presentation, uh, staff is recommending that uh, the council adopted the determination that the proposal is exempt under CEQA guideline section 15301 class one for existing facilities. Introduce the first reading, the ordinance provided as attachment A, approving the proposed tax amendment to allow an existing legal non-conforming hotel in the R2 or R3 zoning districts to apply for CUP to open its existing full service restaurant to the general public. And three, Grant the appeal and approve conditional use permit 21 ENT-0090 to allow the Oceana Hotel to open its existing restaurant to the general public subject to the staff recommended, recommended findings and conditions. Four, grant the appeals and approve conditional use permit 20 ENT-0237 to amend the Oceana Hotel's existing CUP for alcohol service to align with the hotel's restaurant operations subject to the staff recommended findings and conditions. And finally, approve the statement of official action. So with that, I conclude my presentation, but I am available to answer any question from council. Thank you. Thank you very much for that great report. Um, council members, so let me tell you what we're going to be doing. So we could ask questions of staff now, or we could hear a presentation from the appellant who is really the applicant and hear public comment and then the rebuttal and then ask questions. So does, yeah, I mean, okay, good. So why don't we start by hearing from the appellant applicant who will have 10 minutes. And could you tell us how you would like to uh, use your 10 minutes? Yeah, so you're going to use, so typically people leave a little bit at the end, so after the public speaks, they can address what the public said. Unlike last time, I didn't time it exactly, so I'm not sure. I think it's, we'll leave a few ample minutes for anything else that I have to do on a rebuttal. Please. Well, do you want us to warn you at a certain point? Yeah, seven minutes, warn me. Okay. Denise, you're better at this than I am. You got it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> First, I want to add my congratulations. I'm Jim Lippman. I know all of you have now got to know me. I want to add my congratulations to the storm. <laughs> That's on me. I apologize. <laughs> Give it a minute. <laughs> Regroup. Turn it back on. Okay. 
<laughs> oh, there it is. Thank you. First, I want to again thank city staff for their time and most of all, their recommended approval of this text amendment and CUPs. I also want to thank the city council for taking the time to hear this issue again and for hopefully following the city's recommendation to approve the text amendment and the new CUPs. I have had the opportunity to speak with a number of you to hear your feedback and have ensured that we address those concerns. I purchased the hotel from the original owner in 1994. Hotel Oceana is and will remain a family owned and operated hotel. The restaurant, the Sandpiper, is named after my three year old granddaughter, Piper, and my daughter, Alex, who is here tonight, oversees the hotel. I have been a good, quiet neighbor for almost 30 years. We have designed and maintained the hotel to be discreet and quiet, a hidden gem in the neighborhood. The hotel itself is designed to feel intimate and give the feeling of being a guest's second home. The Oceana is built around a central courtyard that furthers its quiet, secluded feel. Our reasons for requesting this is first and foremost to be a good neighbor and provide a walkable neighborhood restaurant. Over the years, we've been forced to turn down our neighbors who visit the hotel asking to have a cup of coffee or a quiet breakfast. We want to be able to invite these neighbors into the hotel to enjoy our views and hopefully, most of all, to tell their friends and family who come to visit that the Oceana is a place to stay. This will enable our restaurant employees, many of whom have been with us for over 20 years, to hopefully make a little more in tips and enjoy a more stable schedule. Our restaurant is small. We have only 12 tables. We do not advertise. There's no separate signage for the restaurant. The restaurant has no entrance from the street and is only open to and accessible through the internal courtyard of the hotel. We will further commit to never creating any additional entrance from the street. We have spoken with numerous neighbors leading to this meeting and know we have overwhelming support. That said, we want to make sure we address those few concerns raised by some of our neighbors. In conjunction with city staff and in response to comments and suggestions from city council, we have agreed to a number of restrictions and changes to operations as set forth in the new CUPs. One, presently there are no restrictions on the restaurant's hours. The new CUP will limit the restaurant's hours to between 7 a.m. and 10 p.m. Two, again, concurrently, there are no restrictions for deliveries at the hotel. Under the proposed restrictions in the CUP, we will only be permitted to have deliveries three days per week between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. They stepped on my thing. We offered last time to change that to three days between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. to reduce it further for our neighbors in the alley, which we've agreed to. Under the CUP, we'll agree to never lease the restaurant out to a third party operator. The fourth, under the CUP, we'll introduce an incentive program for neighbors enjoying the hotel so that if they come over, they, we will offer them a complimentary dish or non-alcoholic drink to those who walk or bike to the hotel. As set forth in the CUP, we will park all visitors to the hotel through our valet on Ocean Avenue, which is open 24 hours. And we will establish a bike valet for those guests arriving on bikes. But we are proposing going even further, and we will commit to park any outside restaurant guest who arrives after 7 p.m. in our carports which do not require the opening of the garage gates at all. And if we should run out of carports for outside guests, we will agree to leave the garage gates open and have them attended by staff. Under the CUP, there shall be no queuing associated with valet parking on or along Idaho Avenue. Valet and associated queuing shall be conducted in front of the hotel on Ocean Avenue. 
Seven, under the CUP, there shall not be a bar within the restaurant or in any public or common areas on the premises that exclusively serves alcoholic beverages. Eight, under the CUP, alcoholic beverage service and consumption shall only be provided and served to patrons in conjunction with meal service or food to non-hotel guests. And finally, under the CUP, for the first three years following the council's approval, we will submit an annual compliance report to the Planning Commission to allow them to take any feedback from the city or from neighbors and add any additional restrictions as may be necessary. That said, as I said before, I will not wait for the years to pass to address any concerns of my neighbors that may come up as I intend to continue to be a good neighbor as I have been for the last 30 years. I hope all of these changes address the concerns and make Oceana an even better neighbor in the community. Thank you again for your time and consideration, and I hope that you will follow the city staff's recommendation and approve this text amendment and the CUPs. And I'd be happy to answer any questions, and I don't know if you're having them now. Thank you, Mr. Lithman. Great job. You have three minutes and 53 seconds left. So uh, any questions for Mr. Lithman? Um, so let's, uh, seeing none, you may have a seat because now we're going to take um, uh, comments from the community and I have the list, so let's do it now. Uh, I'll read the first three names. So for those of you who haven't been here for two years like the rest of us, okay, this is what we do. I will call three names and you'll line up on that wall and come up in order. Each of you will have two minutes. After the second person, I'll call the next three names and we'll fill in accordingly. So our first three speakers are Grant Schaefer, Stephanie Lineback, and Emily McCarran. And Mayor, just a reminder that we have an interpreter if one is needed. Oh, thank you very much. We do have an interpreter should you need one. So, and Mr. Schaefer, you can step up to the mic, and it's on, and go for it. <laughs> hey, guys. Hello, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Grant Schaefer, and I'm a Santa Monica resident, and I support the Oceana's application to make the small restaurant available to members of the community. When I ride my bike path, the bike path to meet my sister at the park near the Oceana, she lives on 3rd on Montana, I always glance over to see if the Oceana's small restaurant is open, thinking I may gra grab a spur of the moment coffee or lunch or work from home at one of their tables. Of course, it still isn't open and that's why I'm here tonight. If the Oceana receives permission to serve a few extra customers, it'd be great, a great option for the locals and their families. I'm a huge proponent of supporting local businesses to help economic recovery post pandemic. And I urge you to grant the appeal and let the hotel move forward with their idea. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. And for all of you out there who are, no, no, you go, but I'm going to say to all of you out there, that's a good example. You don't have to use your entire two minutes. So next. <laughs> yes, and this is Stephanie Leinbach, yes. right? Hello, I'm, my name is Welcome. Stephanie Leinbach. I've lived in Santa Monica for the last five years. I used to live on 10th Street, and now I live on 6th Street. During this time, I've always really enjoyed walking around the cities, especially to the various restaurants. I run near Palisades Park and pass by the Oceana frequently. I've always wanted to go inside and check out the restaurant. By allowing Oceana to open its doors to community members like myself, my friends and I will have access to a nice neighborhood restaurant to walk or bike to instead of driving south to Venice or east to Hollywood. The hotel's restaurant is already there, so I really don't see this as any sort of increased intrusion to the neighborhood. Therefore, I respectfully ask you to approve Oceana's request. Thank you, Ms. Lineback. Another good example. <laughs> Okay, Ms. McCarran. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Emily McCarran. I'm wearing a million masks because of an immune issue, so I will try to speak as clearly as possible. I also urge you to adopt the 13 item that provides for in-person and phone testimony for at least a little while. I have lived in Santa Monica for 13 years. I've never owned a car while I've lived here, and I've managed to get to events, to classes, and even to city council hearings <laughs> by public transportation or on foot. We're used to hearing about amenami uh, well, amenities that are pedestrian friendly, but I'd like to use a common term. 
foot traffic. Foot traffic is super important to small businesses and restaurants that are adjacent to residential neighborhoods. A lot of small businesses and restaurants depend on it. I assume some of you have had a meal at Shea Mimi on Colorado Avenue. It's a great example of a neighborhood restaurant that depends to a great extent on foot traffic for new diners and repeat business. The open door Oceana, as I call it, and the Shea Mimi restaurants are different in many ways, but they have the same role. They provide a third space for people who want to get out of their apartments or condos and have a meal with friends. Small neighborhood restaurants can serve as the glue that holds committees together. There's nothing like breaking bread with friends and seeing familiar faces. The north end of the Oceana, of the Ocean Avenue begs for a small eatery. Please provide the CUP and the text amendment. Thank you very much, Ms. McCarran. And uh, the next three speakers, Laura Wilson, Elizabeth Lehrer, and Jacob Gorin. Um, so, uh, who's contributing? Okay, good. So, um, and Madam Clerk, do you have that in your, okay, good. Okay, good. So, you're all set. Okay. So, the main criteria for spot zoning is simple. The public at large must benefit from spot zoning. This private company and this spot zoning is intended to financially benefit one family at the expense of the loss of the peace, quiet, and enjoyment of the people who live in this neighborhood. The public at large will not benefit from a restaurant that cost $81 for a spaghetti and meatballs, a side dish, and a $22 drinks with a 25% surcharge. Thus, the spot zoning is illegal. The lack of parking alone is enough to say no, let alone the influx of hundreds of new customers to this residential location. And when you allow spot zoning, in one location in a property, other owners are gonna be screaming, what about us? They can't do that, you have to let us do it too. I know this firsthand. Soon after the Oceana received its, granted its first variance to remain after it was down zoned and was supposed to be phased out after 20 years, Chris Harding, on behalf of the embassy owners, rent control departments, wrote a letter to the city claiming the right to operate a hotel. I know for a fact, I would not be living next door to a hotel, a horrible, life-changing event, 24-7 noise, if the Oceana had not been granted the zoning variance for a non-conforming use. The variance included the caveat that it would not expand the commercial use beyond the hotel guest use. And by the way, the city attorney had no legal standing to negotiate for rent-controlled buildings to be changed into the illegal use into a hotel. According to the rent control, char control charter, only the rent control bar has the power to negotiate that. How the city attorney was able to negotiate the illegal conversion of a rent control building into a full-scale 24-7 hotel baffles me and leaves me with little trust that this variance change will not affect where I live now. It leaves me with little trust in our city staff, our city attorneys, and our city council people. The big joke I heard at Planning Commission is that it will somehow help with the recovery of the city. Allowing the commercialization of our residential neighborhoods with a bar, really, does that what the city believes is what is going to be good for recovery? How many times are you going to use this as an excuse to evade our residential neighborhoods? If you want economic recovery, start with the downtown zone where commercial zones are already allowed. Clean up the Third Street Promenade. 13 stores are closed on the first block alone. Another attempt to uh, justify this argument that it's walkable. Hello, we live in a walkable city. There's about 50 walkable places just from this location alone. This argument is a joke. I've seen firsthand how one little variance, variance for the Oceana had a ripple effect that destroyed people's homes. When the Oceana was granted their first variance, the ripple effect was we lost 38 rent controlled homes. And I lost the peace, quiet, and enjoyment of my home. I was woken up this morning at 6 a.m., 5 a.m., 4 a.m., 3 a.m. And your staff is lies. You have to know that. They said that the Polly House always had a restaurant. I lived there for 15 years. There was no food service now. So now you're going to say it's exempt from the, uh, from the Environmental Act because it already has a restaurant? It never had a restaurant. 
That restaurant was put in after you let them illegally convert. The fact that some people on this dais are blind to the fact that the variance will have a massive impact on the residents you, that trusted you to protect them makes it clear you do not belong in the seats you sit in. You do not belong in the seats you sit in if you grant this variance, period. And the parking, it's not utilized because it's $61 and it's free to park two blocks away, one block away. That's why their parking is not utilized. Nobody wants to pay for the parking. I wish you'd ask me questions because I know everything about this. Thank you very much, Ms. Wilson. So, uh, Mr. Gorin, if you hold off one minute, I'm gonna call the next three names, which are the last three names, and that would be Peter Rogers, Jerry Rubin, and Elizabeth Vandenberg. Mr. Gorin. Thank you, Mayor and Council. My name is Jacob Gorin. I've been living in Santa Monica for the past several years. Um, to me, one of the most attractive parts of living in this city is uh, the accessibility to all the local businesses and restaurants. Um, I do love that I can walk or bike um, to several places uh, near my house, anywhere in the city, um, with great restaurants, businesses to stop into. It's part of the reason why I moved here and part of the reason why I have people come visit. Um, what the Oceana is proposing would fit perfectly with what makes the city great. Uh, I have no doubt that the Oceana would keep its brand as a modest and uh, peaceful establishment with this change and can't see how it would be a negative impact for any of the neighbors, uh, given that the restaurant already exists here. Uh, see nothing but a net positive here for the city. Uh, with that, I respectfully urge you to approve Oceana's request. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Uh, uh, Gorin, I'm sorry. Uh, Peter Rogers is next, and then Jerry Rubin, I'm sorry. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Thank you so much for your time tonight. My name is Peter Rogers, and I support the Oceana's application to make their restaurant available to members of the Santa Monica community. I first moved to Santa Monica in 2017, and I'm a proud citizen of this city. In January, I moved into a new home on Montana Avenue with my girlfriend. We frequently walked to the Palisades Park to picnic or watch the sunset, and we have ventured into Oceana's lob lobby several times to ask to get a coffee or a meal, only to be told that hotel guests can enjoy the restaurant. Santa Monica is supposed to be a beautiful and inclusive community. This restaurant would allow for neighbors to enjoy a quiet meal after watching a sunset over the bluffs in a part of the neighborhood that is devoid of restaurants. I urge you to grant the appeal and let the community get more out of their local businesses while supporting the city's economic recovery after COVID. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Rubin, you're up now. Thank you very, very much. Jerry Rubin, Santa Monica, Madam Mayor, Council Members, City Manager, City Staff, and fellow Santa Monicans. Well, after hearing the City Staff's thorough report, hearing uh, many of the compromises that have been made that I think the appeal should be granted. I'm not gonna be able to afford to eat there, ever. And I'm kind of a big fan of union hotels and I wonder if that'll ever happen. But there's residents there, even living right nearby, they can't eat there. And that just doesn't seem right <laughs> on Ocean Avenue. That people, not only residents, but people visiting from around the country, around the world, are told, I'm sorry, if you're not paying to be a guest here, no, you can't eat here. <laughs> this sounds un-Santa Monica to me. I can't imagine it really getting out of hand. And I do hope the gentleman here that spoke that promised all these things will do it. And I think the council will make sure that happens. So I don't think the fears are really gonna be justified in the future. And the people that do wanna eat there and can afford to eat there will be able to do it. I wonder why they won't consider getting a quieter garage door in the first place too. That might be a good idea. Anyhow, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rubin. Ms. Vandenberg. <laughs> I lost it. Good evening, Mayor Hemmelrich and council members. Elizabeth Vandenberg, resident and Wilmot chair. The Wilmot board opposes the approval of the two cups given the intensification of a non-conforming business in the Wilmot neighborhood. 
the application for the zoning text amendment should be denied because there is no need to create an exemption that guts the clear purpose of the ordinance and establishes a precedent for other non-conforming uses to pursue proposals that expand the commercialism in the neighborhood and the city. There's no doubt that Oceana, which Hilton announced in January 2021, to be part of the Hilton LXR hotels and resorts will be marketing and intensifying its commercial impact on our neighborhood. This is not about a few neighbors stopping by for coffee and breakfast, but the intensification of non-hotel guests use of the facility, be it for dining or tailored events. The staff report states the impact of the two cups on the neighborhood will be insignificant, yet the Oceana Hotel 1996 cup stated, the alcohol service is only for registered guests of the hotel and their visitors, thereby not significantly in increasing hotel-related impacts on the neighborhood. The council determined seven years ago in 2015 that existing non-conforming operations should not be in intensified. The applicant's proposal does exactly that. Is it just old-fashioned to ensure that residents are protected from commercial impact? Our residents continue to be blindsided by the continuing commercial invasion into our neighborhood. The 24-7 Pally Pal House at 3rd and Washington, which Ms. Wilson talked about, and the events, event space being built on 4th and Montana. What is next? The Sovereign and the Charmont apartment buildings being sold so they can evict hundreds of residents and turn them into hotels? What would we prefer is that the Oceana Hotel be changed back into its original state, an apartment building that houses its restaurant, houses residents, sorry. I'm looking at the owner. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Vandenberg. And I believe that ends our uh, public comment, unless I'm missing something. Do I have control over that beeping, by the way? That's the minutes. Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. No, okay, no. so uh, I'm turning um, now. Uh, council, it's time for us to uh, ask. Oh, I'm sorry, he does. And, and so I'm sorry, yes, please. They're, they're coming, they're coming. And, and you're tough grilling by the council, right? Because we ask questions too. <laughs> so I want to. Is it on? Yes, it is on. So I want to clarify a couple of things. The discussion about the Pally House has nothing to do with us, and we've been running our hotel for over thirty years. In addition, there's some misconstrued additional things. This hotel, I met with the owner's son, who was in his 60s when I bought the hotel in 1994. I actually met with him in 1993. This hotel has always been run as a hotel. It was built as a condominium or rental, whichever. I'm not sure which one they said condominium. But it always operated as a hotel, certainly since 1958, which I thought was even the opening. So the 57 and 58. So again, I want to point that out. In addition, in terms of parking, when our hotel is full, and on weekends, fortunately, more recently, after struggling for a couple years, we've been full, we have checked, and we never run with more than 25 to 30 cars in the parking lot. Lastly, we have tried to do, excuse me, I would appreciate if you allow us to talk. No, 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 please, we, we need no comments from the uh, gallery. He is entitled to his time, and we'll give you um, additional if you need it. Go ahead. Thank you. Lastly, I will make a commitment to the neighborhood, which is what I've been trying to do with each and every one of these things, to find a win-win. And as for the garage doors, which we've addressed in so many ways, I want to assure everyone that we have worked with multiple companies to try to find ways to reduce the noise as much as we can. And if there is a way in the foreseeable future, whether it's a year or two that they come up, which they usually do with advances, that can get us to make them even quieter, I commit that we will go forward with that as well. And as we pointed out, we will be coming before you or having a report before you for each of the next three years. With that, I don't really have much more to say other than to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Council member, okay, so other 
Raise your hands if you have questions. Okay, so Councilmember Davis, Councilmember Negretti, and then Councilmember Bra. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, I just have a couple of questions. One is, would you also agree not to advertise the restaurant as a separate entity? I mean, I understand you'll advertise your hotel and say you have a restaurant inside of it, but will we start seeing advertisements for the Sandpiper restaurant without being connected to the hotel? No. Okay. And then um, would there be separate signage for the restaurant? So as I walk by the Oceana on Ocean, will I see a separate sign for the Sandpiper restaurant? Absolutely not. And would you have any objection to those two restrictions being included as part of the CUP? Not at all. And then my final question is, um, uh, oftentimes neighbors, if they do have concerns, aren't quite sure who to call. Um, will you make available, for example, to the Wilmot Neighborhood Group, either a, a phone number that can be, you know, that they can call if they do have concerns about excessive noise or something like that? Absolutely. Okay, great, thank you. Councilmember DeGretti. Good evening. I had one, uh, two questions. One is the gate that's there now was has that gate changed over the last sixty-two years, or has that pretty much been the gate? No, it did change, and it's much, much quieter. <laughs> um, obviously, we run a hotel, and there are rooms adjacent to those gates as well, and so we have both insulated them, modernized them to make them as modern as we possibly could, and obviously, in our case. If we can find a way, we've done the same thing with windows for the hotel. If we can find a way to make them quieter, we will even do that. But they are not that noisy. They don't go up very often because we don't have that many cars parking in the hotel. And is it the equivalent to what an apartment gate would be in the same alleyway? Certainly quieter than what they would have in the alleyway. Okay. Um, and then my other question was there was a, the comment made that potential, alluding to the fact that there would potentially be more than just people dining in the small restaurant. So just to be clear, are you, you, there's no plan to allow large events, large scale events in this? By no means. We want, the hotel is mostly for the use of our guests and the quiet enjoyment of our guests. What we are trying to do is, and one of the speakers came up and said it is, we have people coming in and they ask to come in to have a cup of coffee or whatever and we have to turn them away and some of you have come to the hotel and had never stepped in before as well. So the opportunity for someone to not be turned away, who doesn't like the Oceana because they're turned away, and to come in and see how nice it is and recommend it to their family and friends would be a great thing for and them. And I just want to reiterate, it is not to sell alcoholic beverages without your meal. So in essence, it's not to turn it into a bar or a nightclub. Farthest thing from what we want to be. Okay, thank you. So... I know we've talked about garage doors a lot, and and the residents directly east of you have complained about the garage doors and the deliveries. Um, is it possible for you to actually restrict deliveries to 10 to 4, three days a week, and still operate the restaurant with fresh food and, and fresh supplies? Yes, absolutely. We went over this with our both our general manager as well as the president of our hotel division, and there'll be no problem with us doing that. Okay, so you will reduce the amount of noise that some neighbors have complained about for years when they've said that uh, they've called hotel management or the front desk and haven't got any results. We will go further. We, As you asked for, we will have a number that people can call. We are gonna reduce the hours significantly. Um, but we will, with that phone line, we will actually keep track of that phone line. And if we have a delivery one, we will make the city council aware of it. And we will tell you what our action is because we will make sure that those deliveries take place between 10 and 4, three days a week. And you and your daughter are committed to be good neighbors to the Wil uh, Wilshire, Montana neighborhood. Absolutely. And my mom and dad, which I said lived in that for the latter part of their life, on 201 Ocean Avenue. Thank you very much. Councilmember De La Torre. Go ahead. And, and I want to make a very, I, I want to, and this may be a question for staff, but you will be filing reports annually. And can staff require that if something is askew that we change that conditional use permit once it's been granted? 
That's probably for you. Jinx got it. I, I had to get you up for a minute. <laughs> I'll be here all night. Um, so uh, for, for CUPs, they actually run with the land. So once you grant, uh, well, you're not granting a CUP in that year long, you know, the authorization of it, but they run with the land. So once that permit is granted, it runs forever. Now, the way the condition, condition number 13 um, talks about that annual compliance report for three consecutive years. And what it allows us to do is evaluate the operations and then impose, um, help hold a public hearing at the Planning Commission and impose additional conditions and adjust to address any um, operational concerns that are raised. Is there a reason that uh, reports cannot be filed after that? Can we make those biennial after that? and continue them on? C certainly the council can propose whatever condition you, you would like. I was just stating that's the way the conditions are. Because I know that in the past, sometimes residents have said that we've been great at our initial supervision and then the supervision has evaporated. So uh, if I'd like to recommend then that we go to biannual reports after every after the first three years so that the residents and the neighborhoods uh, feel that they are still being supported by the Planning Commission and city staff and that the owner will continue to be responsive. I have no Is that okay with you? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. There you go. Council Member De La Torre. Yeah, yeah it was, uh, I was, wanted to ask a question about the, uh, well, just I'll ask you, uh, Mr. Lipman. First of all, thank you for your response on this. Everything, every, every problem that is, surface so far you have you have been agreeable you know to find a solution for it so i, I appreciate that uh that that you're um taking that position because i think that shows you you being responsible uh in, in terms of the concerns that the residents are raising um what's your expectation of this annual report what what do you think needs to go in it i, I heard one thing uh, in terms of tracking phone calls but just what what is the uh, expectation that you have uh, for this report we're going to basically, and I thought the phone line was a great recommendation, we will basically track any and all issues that any neighbors are bringing up and investigate those issues, okay? We do not expect to have very many because the restrictions that we put in place are going to only benefit for the neighborhood and our neighbors in the alleyway as well. And again, we are clearly, which seems to be misconstrued, not looking to turn this into a restaurant a bar where there's a scene there. This would It's a courtyard setting which would make noise. So we intend to give something that will give each and any of the complaints or issues that have been raised and what we've done to mitigate them in the time frame. We will be happy to share those at any time with the city council that they want. Great, thank you. And and just uh, in terms of the brand, the, the brand for your for your hotel, uh, it, it's very different, let's say, than the Shore Hotel. You know, that's right across from the pier where all the action is. The Oceana Hotel is far removed, not far removed, but pretty much removed from all the, I guess, uh, what you would call sort of the downtown core of activity that people expect when they come to Santa Monica. Uh, is it is it fair to, to 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 categorize sort of your hotel as like a low? Uh, more like a residential feel or a uh, just a how how would I how how would you brand it you know in terms of your hotel being different than than sort of the other hotels that we that we so see we, sorry so we brand it as an exclusive home away from home leisure experience in one of the finer areas of Santa Monica and quiet when you want to get outside of being in the action so the last thing we would want to do is to create that and we want to basically be able to give a fine dining experience to any and all neighbors that want to come in and they could be coming in for a Coke or a cup of coffee or a breakfast or a dinner. So is it safe to say then that the experience that you want for people that, that uh, you know, rent rooms or or uh, buy a night uh, in, in your hotel, stay, stay over in your hotel, it's safe to say that uh, you want them to have sort of more uh, peace and quiet than, let's say, other hotels in the city where there's more, a little bit more noise, more ruckus. Is that is that safe to say that that's a absolutely, and that's how we promote our hotel. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so Councilmember McCallan, and Mr. then Councilman. Um, just a quick clarification. So, in the um, staff report, it talks about the because of the layout, there is sort of this built-in waiting area, and it talks about how the lobby would in effect be the waiting area. And I think 
any of us that sort of get out and about and support our local restaurants know that, you know, some days it, you go to a place thinking you're going to wait 20 minutes and suddenly everyone, for whatever reason, happened upon the same restaurant that Saturday morning. And the wait can kind of, you know, fall out onto the street or already be in the street or in the parking mm -hmm. lots. And I'm just, what is the plan behind how many can the lobby accommodate as a waiting area? What becomes a little challenging to your quiet courtyard ambiance that would then go into the lobby? And at what point do we start going out into the street and how do you intend to discourage that? From we, would sorry. we would actually come back um, and look at how we could constrain it because the last thing that we want at the hotel is one person to wait for one second. So we do not expect to be looking at this. That's why when we were asked, are we gonna advertise this as a separate restaurant? We are basically expecting there to be from the neighborhood of three to 12 additional guests that'll come in in a day. We know because we have people that come in frequently into the hotel because they're walking through and they say, can we come in and we have to turn them away in the lobby. So we do not, because it would be detrimental to the operations of the hotel, intend to have standing room and people having to wait to get tables. We do not anticipate or expect that at all. No, you may not anticipate it, but I think it's a natural thing that follows. I, I know just speaking from experience, I when uh, Lunetta is one of our neighborhood spots. Oh, Raphael, well. Right? It, it, we have a few um, around, you know, near where we live, but I, I mean, I think we go there all the time because it's super convenient and we can go and get the kids breakfast or something pretty easily and not have to travel very far and it's good quality food. And so I, it will inevitably happen. And so I don't expect you to have an answer. I, the intention is there. I know you guys will work on it, but I think you might have to find yourself figuring out how to accommodate more people coming in for, and, and, and just how you do that to, to be in line with sort of what we would like the, the uh, outcome of this to be based on all of these conditions right. you see these. So, but thanks. Thank you for entertaining it. And I'm glad you guys are thinking about it. Thank you. Um, so, uh, council member Parr. Hi. Hi, Mr. Whitman. Thank you so much for, um, humoring us with all these questions. <laughs> um, I had, uh, we've received obviously a bunch of emails. Um, and one of the questions that keeps coming up, I was just wondering if you can, um, explain a little bit about your relationship with the LXR hotel and resorts. So... LXR is part of the Hilton, and LXR is their luxury, um, uh, you know, brand that is a soft brand, meaning it's we are still the Hotel Oceana, but we get to use their distribution channel. The principal benefits that we get from LXR is, again, when I have my friends and my accent gives it away, I'm a native New Yorker, although I've been living out here since... 1989, so it's a long time. But I tell people Santa Monica is, when you're from anywhere else, quintessential LA. It's exactly what you think about. So um, we basically, you know, and, and I lost it in terms of that. We repeat your question one more time. <laughs> no, that's okay. I just wanted to um, explain your, your relationship with LXR. So basically, we explained it. So what we end up getting at LXR more than anything else are redemptions. So when you have a hotel, um, the biggest thing that'll come in is guests that gain lots of points in the Hilton system who want to come in and use their points and stay at a luxury hotel. That's what an LXR brand hotel would be because it's high end. So we get a lot of redemptions. We, they assist us in uh, procuring things for less money. They make sure that they check on the quality service by having people come in all the time to make sure that we're meeting the quality expectations of what they are. But we still keep the identity of a family-run and owned and operated hotel. Okay. 
Thank you for explaining that because I know there's, you know, there's a lot of rumors out there about what that relationship is and what it means. And so um, I'm glad you're able to clarify that a bit. Uh, and then also, um, I think one thing that I just realized right now um, that I didn't communicate during my ex party, I drove by the property, so I should have communicated that, right? Um, I drove by the property and I drove by the back of it um, and because um, I wanted to take a look at the, the garage again and I noted and I counted, I think there was 15 um, garage doors? Bays. Bays? It carports? Is that, car, is, it, is that what you were calling carports when you were talking? So we have two garages which you would have seen, those are the ones with big gates okay. on, on both sides, mm -hmm. one on the south and one on the north. Okay. In between, we have carports, a couple of them with no gating. Okay. Those are ones that if we had restaurant outside restaurant guests that come up with a car mm -hmm. after 7 p.m., that would be the first place we would park them. And so we that's don't what you were calling in. carports. That's okay, what so that's what I was going to ask. The okay. ones that are, have gates on them are closed because those are used okay. primarily for storage. Okay, so that was my other question. Um, okay, and then my other question was, but I guess Jean kind of asked it, um, answered it was, uh, can we ask, um, so Jean, you, 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 you answered the question, so the CUP or the CUP runs with the land so we couldn't put anything in there that says that if the property is sold, mm -hmm. um, it's not it's nullified. I think the parlor. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, all right. I think that's it for my questions right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I think everyone else, having asked their questions, I I'm going to go, and good evening, Mr. Lippman. You and I have not met. Yes. Uh, yeah. What? I do have questions, oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's not just an introduction. You and I have I'm not met. if you pass this, then I can invite you as a guest and you can come. I've been a guest. I want you to know I not only have stayed at your hotel, but my brother stayed there two weekends ago. So I'm very familiar with the hotel. So my first question is, and, and by the way, I'm opposed to text amendments, so I'm not going to be voting for that. I, I just have to tell you. Um, it, it is a, my belief that text amendments are not something we should be doing. So, um, but I do have a couple questions. Uh, the, it, so how much is parking per day at the hotel? I heard it was sixty-one dollars. Is that correct? Fifty-five. Twenty-four hours. So uh, when guests come, uh, uh, when guests come to the restaurant, you charge them for parking. We well, we we haven't had guests come to the hotel. If and when we have guests, we do have hourly rates for parking. And how much is the hourly rate? Okay, I'm just, an, I sort of have an idea. Thank you. Uh, so, um, and my next question is, do you have any discounts for locals, for seniors, for anything like that? So we're going to be offering, as you know, as part of the CUP, uh, a drink, a non-alcoholic drink, or some kind of food for any outside guest that's coming in by bicycle or walking. I do understand that I'm asking about something a little different. So we are granting this permit, well, sorry, we're granting it a permit that presumably will generate more income for you. And what I'm asking you is whether people who are not guests in your hotel and who are Santa Monica locals and who can show a driver's license or some such thing, is there a chance that you would give them a discount? We actually do give... We actually, so I'll answer, we, we actually do give them a discount on rooms. So we do have a local discount if they're calling for that. As it relates to food, we lose over half a million dollars a year on food and beverage today. We would be happy to do that if we were ever making money on food and beverage. What we are going to be doing is allowing our employees 
that work there to make a few extra dollars and to have more stable employment. From the food standpoint, we're going to be offering them the opportunity to come in and enjoy the quiet enjoyment of the Oceana. Uh, thank you. And do you um, uh, provide parking to your employees? We do. All of them? Well, most do not, which we just checked on. Yes, but many of them commute by public transportation. Um, and if somebody wanted to rent the entire hotel for an event, would you allow that? We would not allow it. We've done it once in the history of the hotel. I will acknowledge that for a very dear friend's wedding for a three-day thing a long time ago. Um, we, we, we don't do that. We don't even rent more than a few rooms at a time to a group because we're a very small hotel of 70 suites, and we try to keep it that way. Uh, great. Thank you. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, Brock and then Negretti. Jim, uh, following up on what Mayor Himmelrich said, um, I am concerned about a rate of what for two hours to eat there? If you, if once you open, uh, I'm sorry. What, what is your val What it would be the would parking be charge rate? for a guest who is just going to have dinner there? So the parking charge for two hours is twenty dollars. So more than entrees at most restaurants. Is Boy, there is? Uh, huh? Is, sorry, your staff is saying that's your 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 team is saying there. That's, so. So I, I, my, my point, I think, would be if I think one of the problems that the neighbors are worried about is increased traffic in their neighborhood. If you're charging that much money for someone to eat at the hotel, then I know I would look on the street to find a place to park rather than pay the cost of one entree to a normal restaurant to park there for two hours. Now, I, I know there is free parking on Ocean Avenue after 6 p.m., and it's not a permit zone. But not everyone will know that, and I want to make sure people are not trying to park on 2nd or 3rd or Washington or California or Idaho. So I would recommend, I don't know if we can put this in as a, as a condition, but I would recommend that valet parking be no more than, let's say, 6 to $8 I, I think that's ridiculous. And, and by the way, I'm not advocating for people to drive to the restaurant. So I, I want you to know that I want people bicycling, walking, e-scootering, you know, whatever. But if they do drive to the restaurant for dinner and you're charging 20 to $28 for valet, for me, I will uh, use extra gas to park in the neighborhood, regardless of whether it makes sense or not. Well, so, I think Mr. Lippin may have an answer on the dollar amount on the part. Thank you. We don't have an answer on the dollar amount yet. We're just trying to find out. But, no, no, no. So, no. so I'm I, sorry. We don't take what so I Jim, just wondered. You just had but that. I have, but I, I will give you some, so to answer in a couple of ways and take under advisement for the other. Our, the way we set our parking rates, we have, and we pay these people, obviously, we have three valet parkers outside. And to be really clear with our, employees, because this is not, again, part of the money-making part. Rooms is the money-making part. I mean, by way of example, with uh, the same with them, is if we have a housekeeper with a rate in Santa Monica, seventeen forty, we're paying our housekeepers a minimum of $22 an hour, okay? We That's pay good. We pay our valet parkers in the same kind of way to try to basically do it. So we look at our rates relative to the rates of any of the other hotels, along any of Santa Monica, that's how we charge them. That being said, I will basically look, and what I think we, I just don't know what the answer is yet, what we will look at is as we're starting to open up, if we're seeing, remember, we will be coming back to you, and forget that it's annually, we'll come back to you way before that. If we're seeing that people are coming in and spending money on the dinners, we will come back with a way to offset that against the parking happily. The issue that would make it more difficult is if someone comes in for a Coke and I have that issue. So we will clearly come back to you, which is one of the requests that you had, with ways that we can further enhance that. 
Yeah, I would at least look at FIG, other restaurants at hotels in Santa Monica, find out what they're charging at the uh, Mexican Spanish restaurant on 20th and Santa Monica, at FIG, at Lowe's, at the other restaurants, and keep that comparable. Because what I don't want to see is tons of people, uh, even though it's a small restaurant, looking around the neighborhood trying to park, and then residents can't park there. Residents will then want a permit parking zone. And this is not to, I'm like trying other. Trying to stop the tumbling. So thank you. So and, so let me just say because we're sort of verging into discussion, but this is not like a restaurant in. Uh, you know, like the Mexican restaurant at the corner of 20th and, and Wilshire, or like anything, or Santa Monica, I, I understand. I'm saying it is not the same, and but it's not the same because it's not in the middle of a residential neighborhood. The difference here is that unlike shutters or that, right, that's all. Uh, yeah, so Councilmember Negretti and then Councilmember Davis. I don't think you can park in the neighborhood because it's permitted parking. And just to the point, um, partially, but if I would imagine that if you're not wanting to spend that on valet parking, then you might not be eating out at that restaurant. And they're trying to encourage other modes of transportation. But I also just wanted to make, bless you, I wanted to make a motion to move this item. So move my Negretti. Do I hear a second? And then I'll get to you, Council Member. I'll second. Seconded by Brock and Councilmember Davis. Well, right. Um, I was going to say much of which Councilmember Negretti said, which is actually that entire neighborhood, with the exception of Ocean Avenue, is heavily permitted. Um, and anyone who's tried to park in that neighborhood on a busy ocean day will find out that you can't park there. Um, so I don't think it's going to drive a lot more people to park in the neighborhood. They might find parking on Ocean Avenue, but that doesn't take away any residents' parking. Um, the other comment I want to make is that, actually, I, I think we should charge a lot for parking. I mean, if, if the whole issue is we're worried about people driving to the restaurant to create more traffic, then it seems to me high parking rates are exactly the antidote to that. No one's going to drive to a restaurant and pay $20 to park, or I shouldn't say no one, but fewer people will. The idea is to create a restaurant where people are encouraged to walk and bike. So I think, you know, I, I have a somewhat different view than, than Council Member Brock. I don't think people will be parking in the neighborhood because they won't have the appropriate permits. And I actually think that if we make uh, the parking expensive, we will encourage alternative modes of transportation. And I know we veered into comment, but it seems like we did that. So. Okay, so Council Member Negretti, I know you made this motion, but that actually isn't the first, first motion we need. So I'm going to call for the motion, and you can yeah. make it, okay? So I'm calling for a motion to adopt the determination, and this isn't exactly the motion you wanted to make either, that the proposal to open the Oceana Hotel's existing restaurant to the public is exempt under CEQA guideline 15301, parens class one, for existing facilities and that the project involves the operation, repair, maintenance, permitting, leasing, or licensing of an existing hotel to extend its guest-only meal and alcoholic beverage services to the public in its existing on-site restaurant. So, uh, you are you making that motion? In here? Just yeah, so just say, so moved. So moved. Uh, and seconded by Brock, so moved. Okay, so moved by, um, and you know what, Mr. Lipman, I think that, yes, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So please, sit with your family and let's move on. Uh, okay, so made by uh, Negretti, seconded by Brock, and let's have a roll call vote. Councilmember De La Torre. Yes. Councilmember Brock? Yes. Mayor Potem McCowan? Yes. Councilmember Nergete? Yes. Councilmember Davis? Yes. Councilmember Parra? No. And Mayor Hamelrich? No. So that passes five to two. Now I'm going to ask for a motion to introduce for first reading a proposed ordinance to amend Santa Monica Municipal Code Section 9.08.020 to establish a conditional use permit requirement for an existing legal non-conforming hotel restaurant located within the R2 and R3 zoning districts to request approval to provide meal service to the general 
public provided that certain criteria are made. So moved. Okay, moved by Negretti. Do I hear a uh, second? Second. Seconded by Davis. Uh, now, let's have a roll call vote. Council Member Parra? No. Council Member Davis? Yes. Council Member Gretti? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McCom I'm yes. sorry, McCollin. Council Member Brock? Yes. Council Member De La Torre? Yes. And Mayor Hilmerich? No, so that passes five to two. Yes, now uh, now I'm looking for a motion to grant the appeals of a planning commission's denial of two conditional use permits associated with the Oceana Hotel's request to one, provide meal service to the general public pursuant to the proposed text amendment, and two, modify the hotel's existing alcohol CUP to provide guidance to the general public. Can I just ask a question? Service to the general public, yes. I, I just want to make sure that there were a couple of things that Mr. Littman agreed to. This is That would be in the next motion where we would add those. Is that correct? We don't need to add them to this one. I just want to make sure we put the additions in the right spot. It's probably better to add them to this one since you would be um, simply recording it with the STOA. So if you're modifying the conditions of the conditional use permit, now would be the time to do so. Okay. Oh. Well, she... Next is oh, this is the appeal. Yeah, this my, is the appeal. My, I just want to make. Yes. I just want to yes. make sure we put it in the right. Yeah, this, this is just the grant the appeal. Okay, so, great. Thank yeah, you. Next, yes. Okay. So uh, moved. Moved by Negretti, seconded by. Second. Seconded by McCowan. Let's have a roll call. Sorry, you guys. For the rest of these, <laughs> you won't be using your buttons. What? For the rest of these, you will not be using your buttons. I'll just Why? Because I didn't split them. Yeah. Oh, oh, so, okay. That's uh, let's have a roll call vote anyway, even if we can't use our council button. member De La Torre. Yes. Council member Brock. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McCowan. Yes. Council member Negrete. Yes. Council member Davis. Yes. Council member Parra. No. Mayor Hemelrich. No. Uh, but that passes five to two, even though you can't see it on the screen. And finally, council member Davis. Here we go. Uh, call for a motion to approve conditional use permits 20ENT-0237 and 21ENT-0090. And I think this is where you put the additional. Yeah, so I will move the staff recommendation with the following amendments. One, that there be a condition that the uh, restaurant not be separately advertised, separate and apart from being a part of the hotel. Two, that there be no separate signage for the existence of the restaurant uh, on the building or anywhere else. And three, that uh, the hotel establish a direct telephone line for neighbors to register complaints and that the hotel will uh, keep track of those complaints and the disposition of the resolution of those complaints as part of its reporting process. And Do we um, add the, the uh, biennial reports, reports, biennial reports after the first three years? So. Okay, so, all right, that's fine, and adding biennial reports after the first three years. And were there any other amendments that, uh, no? Okay, so thank you, Council Member Davis. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, moved by Davis, seconded by Negretti. May we have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Parra. No. Council Member Davis. Yes. Council Member Negrete. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McCowan. Yes. Council Member Brock. Yes. Council Member De La Torre. Yes. And Mayor Hilmerich. Uh, no, and that passes five to two. Uh, as amended. Um, and now, finally, I need a motion for approval of the statement of official action. So moved. Moved by Negrete. Second. Seconded by Brock. Roll call vote, please. Council Member De La Torre. What? Oh. Oh, hold on. This, this is for the STOA? Yes. Yeah, so um, we would advise you not, like, you need to see specific language for the STOA. So we can either flash the language on the screen or bring it back. Next. Do you want to flash If you'd like, we've been typing conditions. We could put them up on the screen or we can bring it back at the next meeting. Let's no, let's just do it now. Okay. Well, well, no, because then... Uh, I'm worried that if we don't vote on this here, this now, that when we come back for second reading, then this won't be complete for the second. Uh, you're the experts, but help me with that. Read it now. Why wouldn't we just read it now? Yeah, let's just read it now. 
Okay, good. So we will do this. I, I think that what we'll do is we'll continue this until after 7A, these are all second, 7A and 7B. How about that? Okay, so um, so I, I hate to do this to you, uh, Madam Clerk, but we're skipping to 7A and we'll go back to uh, 6A. Okay, no problem. Okay, item 7A is second reading and adoption of an ordinance amending Chapter 2.48 of the Santa Monica Municipal Code consolidating the Commission on the Senior Community, Commission on the Status of Women, and the Social Services Commission into a newly named commission and repealing Chapters 2.56 and 2.60. And this is a second reading. Yes, yeah, so uh, may I have a motion, please? Move adoption. Moved by Davis. Go ahead, you can Seconded by De La Torre. Let's have a roll call. Council Member Parra? Yes. Council Member Davis? Yes. Council Member Negrete? Yes. Mayor Pro Tim McCowan? Yes. Council Member Brock? Yes. Council Member De La Torre? Yes. And Mayor Hilmerich? Yes, so that passes seven to zero. And now 7B, please. 7B is a second reading and adoption of an ordinance amending Santa Monica Municipal Code section 1104.050, adjusting the city's campaign contribution limit. And this is also a second reading. May I have a motion? I make a motion to move. Moved by? Negretti. Negretti, seconded by Para. Uh, may we have a roll call? Council Member De La Torre? Yes. Council Member Brock? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McCowan? Yes. Council Member Negrete? Yes. Council Member Davis? Yes. Council Member Parra? Yes. And Mayor Hamel Rich? Yes, so that passes seven to zero. And how, so guys, I hate to rush you, but can we go back to it now or, or do we still have more? Let's go do? ahead. This, this third one is the second reading. Let's get through this one real oh, quick. Oh, it is. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm so sorry. Let's do 7C. Right. 7C is a second reading and adoption of an ordinance approving Providence St. John's Development Agreement. And this is also a second reading. Oh, and excuse me, Council Member uh, Negretti needs to look, recuse, recuse herself. herself. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, can we go outside? Uh, yeah, nobody, uh, put your fingers in your, no. Uh, Step out the room. <laughs> you do have to leave the, the room, you have to. It's 9A. Um, a Just leave and we'll talk about that. Uh, yeah, it's uh, vacating the street. Oh, yeah, probably. Uh, when will we have something I can Okay. Move 7C. Uh, moved by Davis, who's second. Uh, may I hear a second on 7C? Second. Seconded by McCowan. Let's have a roll call. Councilmember Parra? Yes. Councilmember Davis? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McCowan? Yes. Councilmember Brock? Yes. Councilmember De La Torre? Yes. And yes. Mayor Himmelrich? Yes, that passes six to zero. Uh, and um, you, did you push your button? Something weird. There we go. Oh, good. Yay. Welcome back. That was your exercise for the yeah. night. Let's come on back. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Are you ready to come back to the look behind? Yeah. Look that way. So these are um, the three new conditions that have been added. The first one is a new condition. An on-site contact person shall be designated to serve as a neighborhood liaison to address any neighborhood concerns related to the hotel operations. Notification of the staff liaison and applicable contact information, including telephone and email address, shall be provided to all residents within a 300-foot radius of the subject site prior to the commencement of the use on the site and at least once per year thereafter. The applicant shall track complaints and how complaints are resolved and submit with the report required in condition number 13. Can, can before we move on, can we add also to the local neighborhood organization to residents within, because they can then disseminate it if they so choose. Did you want to specify Wilshire, Montana, or? Well, no, because okay. I don't know. Ten years down the road, maybe they'll call themselves something else. I just think the or it could be Noma. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I just think 
I, yeah, the local neighborhood organizations, I think, is generic enough. And it might be local neighborhood organizations, because as Mayor Himmelrich points out, NOMA may also want to get notified yeah, of it as well. Downtown. Yeah, so, and, and if there's a downtown group at some point, maybe. So I would just say neighborhood organizations. Um, oh, did, has everybody looked at the language and, and does that suffice, Ms. Yo, for, uh, yeah, so, so we, can we vote on that? Now? Yeah, so th there's that, I'll just read them all. Um, then there's a um, modification to condition number five. This is just adding to the end of it. Mm -hmm. um, this is already talking about um, that the hotel cannot operate, or excuse me, the restaurant can't operate separately from the hotel. So the applicant shall not separately advertise the restaurant from the hotel. No separate signage for the restaurant shall be permitted. And then a modification to condition 13, which is the annual compliance report. And we've added there, um, after three consecutive years, the applicant shall file a compliance report on a biannual basis thereafter. Great. So uh, on that note, shall we move back to item 6A? And uh, may I have a motion to approve the statement of official the motion, action? Uh, the motion was by Council Member yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. By, seconded you by moved it. As amended, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so moved whatever the motion was. Let's have a roll call. <laughs> Whoever made it. So the motion was made by Council Member Negrete and it was seconded by Council Member Brock. Okay, good. Thank you very much. No and, Council um, Member, so Council Member De La Torre. Yes. Council Member Brock. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Cowan. Yes. Council Member Negrete. Yes. Council Member Davis. Yes. Council Member Para. No. And Mayor Hemelrich. No. So that passes five to two. So you have your permit, you have your restaurant. So next we're moving on to item 7D, and we do have a speaker on this item, Mayor. Item 7D is introduction and first reading of an ordinance approving the military equipment use policy. Um, and uh, so first we have our staff report. Um, now I'm guessing it's Captain Covarubias, but is that right? Good evening, Chief. Come on up. <laughs> Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council. Um, I'm going to be handing over the reins here pretty quickly to Captain Corvarubias to go over the entirety of the staff report. I'll tell you that in the last six months that I've been here, I know that um, we have been through changes uh, that stem from the riotous conditions that we experienced in the city of Santa Monica two years ago on May 31st. We made changes to our policy in dealing with protests, uh, according to the OIR report that was handed. Um, and then here more recently, uh, we made changes to our policies in accordance with California Post and this new California law uh, that, that we're going to have the ordinance on today. So we have made the continual changes. Um, the equipment that we have on hand, although deemed uh, military equipment by California law, uh, is equipment that was made solely for domestic policing, domestic public safety in the United States. So um, I'll hand it over to Captain Covarrubias to give you the full explanation. Thank, Thank you, you, Chief. Good evening, Captain. Good evening. Good to see you all. I'm no C. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Um, so the staff report that we did was to basically put us into compliance with AB 481, which was passed in January uh, of this year. And so basically saying any equipment that was purchased through a military type of program, surplus or what have you, uh, on or before January 1st, 2022, would be subject to approval by council. Um, and then it would basically be us coming to council every year with a list of our items that we have in our inventory that qualify under military equipment. 
and you guys would approve it and then we would move forward with that and something that has to be done every year. So prior to us coming to council tonight with the staff report, we were required to post our policy that we would like approval from tonight to on our department website. And that has been up for 30 days. We have not received anything from the community, uh, questions or anything to that nature. And so uh, there's a variety of equipment that we have in our inventory that is deemed military. However, it's not been purchased through the military surplus. Things such as the drone, the mobile command post, our less lethal munitions, our breaching tools that we have, uh, the only two items that we have in our inventory, as you'll see in the staff report, are what are called spotting scopes. And that is basically uh, used by our special weapons and tactics team. And it's uh, specialized equipment that basically allows high magnified optics in order to see at a long range distance. And that how that works is it's just basically you have someone who's in charge of the rifle and you have someone who's got the spotting and you always want to uh, two eyes or four eyes on a situation as we feel that that is better than just one set of eyes. And so that is the only two pieces of equipment that we have that fall under a military <coughs> surplus or that were purchased via the military surplus plan. So um, what we do from here forward is if with your approval, we'll go ahead and basically the policy has been posted. We'd like to move forward and, and present this policy to uh, the PSROC to make sure that they that their input is included in it. And then every year we will come to you with a list of our equipment for you to review, approve, and then we can move forward from there. If we require anything new, that also has to be brought forward to you for review. It's something that we do annually. We will also host an annu annually a community meeting, which will discuss all of this and provide a forum in which our community our residents, our business owners can come and talk to us about the equipment we have, why we use it, its importance, um, and the significance of that. So it's a lot of community outreach, and we feel that it's going to definitely bridge that communication, especially as it pertains to our equipment. We know that there's a lot of questions, why we use certain things that we do, and we want to make sure that the community knows that we're open and we're available to commentary and discussion. Um, so, in terms of public outreach, and I guess I, I'm a little, because when uh, we were doing the agenda setting, so the 30-day notice has already been satisfied. You're going to the PSROC, but that uh, our, the ordinance passing is not contingent on that, right? So, so you'll come back to us for our second reading, but are you going to the PSROC before the second reading? Well, I would like that. I just felt a little... Um, funny going to the PSROC first before talking to council. So uh, I hear you. Look, I was, look, I'm a little confused about this myself. And with respect to the public hearing, do you think that will be, um, uh, I mean, usually this is the public hearing or the commission meeting is the public hearing? Yeah, I think we had to commence the process, which is why we had to come before you tonight. However, if we if they go to the committee and there are significant uh, proposed changes, it would basically have to come back for a new first reading. So okay, but this is a, so we're introducing the ordinance and the concept, but we may come back for more. Correct. Yeah, all of this had to be done or attempted to be done by May 1st, at least our first reading. Got you. Had and, to be and done the, by May 1st. Right, so the public hearing, right? Is this the public hearing? Yes, yes. I yes. see not. Yeah. Yes, but I think the once the ordinance is passed and everything is okay with council, we're able to move forward. Every year we will host a community meeting. Oh, okay. The police department will host it to open up the conversation with, with our residents. Great. Uh, council Member Davis. Well, now I was just going to say, Mayor, real quick on timing uh, and looking at the staff report. So the the approval process has to begin by May 1st, mm -hmm. so we're satisfying that objective. And then it must be adopted within 180 days thereafter. So th to the extent there are any changes, there is time. No, I was just worried about what the hearings were going to look like in terms of public outreach. So, okay. So um, thank you. And Council Member Davis. Yes. Thank you, Captain. Um, I just have a quick question. So um, after we get over this initial 
adoption, um, it says there's going to be a military equipment coordinator and that there will annually be reporting and notifications for the chief, the council, and the annual community engagement meeting. I'm wondering, is there any issue with adding the PSROC as being on that annual uh, list of people that you would formally report to? Since they're, we're consulting with them initially, and presumably they may have some input, I'm just wondering if it makes sense to also annually report to them. Well, I don't think that that would be an issue, but I think that would part of they, they would be a part of that community town hall meeting that we would host because they would definitely be invited to that. But, but I'm just wondering for them to have a discussion about it as a commission, as opposed to being attending a public town hall. I guess that's that's what I'm asking. Is there going to be an opportunity for them on an annual basis to review this? If that's what council deems appropriate, absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yes, Councilmember Rock. Do we still have the Bearcat? Yes, sir, we do. Is that part of considered military equipment? Yes, sir, it is. All right, I didn't see it on here. I didn't. We, we didn't get into the whole There's list. There's not an inventory on yeah. there. Yeah, we, I just I went in there and spoke about particular items that I felt were mostly used uh, that were basically things that were brought up during May 31st um, that I wanted to talk about with council in the staff report. The list is pretty, it's, it, it's a long list of everything that's, that's in there. Yes. But, but, uh, but I think, and, and may I ask a follow-up, please? Because yes, please. I think it's important to think about it. You, yeah, you keep using the verb used, right? But the truth is that we really just, for most years, right, we have it and we don't use it, right? I mean, there are things that are, that we keep, right? Or I, I don't even know how to put it, right? That we possess, but use only when necessary. That's absolutely correct. So when it comes to our... Um, inventory of this type of equipment doesn't mean that it's used on a daily basis most of the time in our city items like this are only used during critical incidents whether it be uh, special weapons and tactics team call out which is a variety of, of critical situations that kidnapping bank robberies hostages things like that that not we don't normally see every day so, and then anything else when it comes to less lethal munitions are all, there has to be a clear and present danger. There's policy outlining how those will be used, how those will be documented, uh, and supervisor approval on such items. But you are absolutely correct. We have this in our inventory as a just in case. It's not part of our day to day operations. And it's not part of your day to day equipment. That's correct. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember De La Torre. Are, are, are there other. Um tools, let's say, that um, that are not listed uh, that might be considered military, for example, like encrypted communication, uh, anything of that nature? Not that I've read in the ordinance, sir. <laughs> okay. And then uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that the uh, Public Safety uh, <clears throat> Reform and Oversight Commission will also, you know, have a chance to weigh in on the policy. So that's, that's a, a best practice. So I, I appreciate that. Yes, Thanks. Sir. So we do have a speaker. Uh, any other questions? No. Okay, so, um, but I don't see him. Do you see Jonathan? Oh, sorry, Jonathan. Didn't see you. Mr. Foster. So, um, I'm sorry, yes. So, you can, I think we're done asking questions, okay. right? So, you're off the hook. All right, ma'am. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. And, Mr. Foster, you're up. It's always beating when I get up here. Hi, everyone. Uh, I have to start with uh, apologizing to Anna at Dispatch, Operator 42 at Dispatch, Officer Fedona with the, on the message went, so I'm not sure, or and Officer Codona, because I called and called and called and called trying to figure out if they were going to call me back and my ringer was down. So my apology to the Santa Monica Police Department because I you know, dealt with them for 22 years on Third Street Promenade. So I've seen them do awesome things. Uh, one of the things I wanted to say about this is uh, this is 100% yes. Yep. Oh, for, yep. Um, support the police department 100%. And every time I say that, there's so many people that don't like me when I get into conversations about it because I do support the police department 100%. I don't like the, what the federal government is doing. 
but I wanted to say something about what I'm seeing here after I've said yes, this is all cool. Just give you my perceptions on some of this stuff. The government gets to make money on this equipment four times in manufacture, purchase, repairs, and resale to state and local cities. And it still ends up needing repairs. Even if it was free, the transfer still moves money. And I wonder if Russia is invading Santa Monica, right? I would think that. But I would want to see money spent on body armor for the police, right? This is what I've said for, some, for many years, even to the LAPD. Uh, I know it's hard to fight if you're doing an arrest where they're not cooperating if you're in body armor, but that can be uh, mitigated with more officers. Some things that I haven't seen. One of the things I also wanted to say, I said, uh, I think that no one's really going to listen to me. So I should do the uh, the peanuts teacher thing and go wall 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 because I know you're not really going to listen to me. But what I'd like to see is more defensive safety for each officer because what this is is like an offensive situation nine seconds. But what I do see one thing weaponized aircraft. We're not going to be using weaponized aircraft in Santa Monica, are we? And so I do approve. I do approve. Thank you, Mr. Foster. <laughs> Um, any comments on this? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Part. So it says here that... Uh, oh, wait, do you want the captain to come back? Uh, well, it's just a question regarding the... Uh, it says, you know, council has a 180-day period from commencing the approval process to the first reading. So this is today, right? That's correct. And uh, so, then, so then you're going to bring back a policy for us? The policy is already attached to the, okay. to the ordinance. Because it said um, 180 days, but it's attached now. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay, so uh, is that it for discussion? Good, let's have a roll call vote. Maybe we should make oh, a wait, motion let me, first. Let me, yeah, let's start. Okay, so yes. Yeah, so let me, I'm going to call for the motion. Sorry, but I'm not on eight. Uh, yeah, this is 7D. So first I need a motion to introduce for first reading an ordinance reading by title only and waiving further reading thereof approving the military equipment use policy in compliance with Assembly Bill 481. Uh, so moved, but with one change that in Section 4B, where it says the police department shall make each annual military equipment report, report required by this section add available to the Public Safety Reform and Oversight Committee and publicly available on its internet website for as long as the military equipment is available for use. So you're adding the PSROC to Yes. That. Yes. So... Um, that they be specifically well, notified of the report. No, 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 I get it. Where is that being added again? I'm sorry. Uh, Section 4B, Annual Reports on the Use of Military Equipment. So you're in the, you're in the ordinance. Huh? Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, I was looking at the policy. Second. Uh, moved by Davis, seconded by Negretti. Uh, roll call vote, please. Councilmember De La Torre? Yes. Councilmember Brock? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McCowan? Yes. Councilmember Negrete? Yes. Councilmember Davis? Yes. Councilmember Parra? Yes. And Mayor Hemelrich? Yes, so that passes 7 to 0. So and can I ask a question of the interim city attorney? Is it okay that we took one vote for both items, or does it need to be separated? No, no, I haven't made, done the second one yet. There's another vote. Uh, right, because we still have to, I was going to call for a motion to direct staff to bring the military use. This is a different bringing it to the PSROC. Uh, what did you say? That's okay, so we can, yeah. Okay, so now if I can have a motion to direct staff to bring the p military police equipment, the military equipment use policy to the Public Safety Reform and Oversight Commission so that the commission has an opportunity to provide input before the ordinance approving the military use policy returns to council. May I have that motion, please? Uh, Move by Para. May I have a second? Second. Seconded by Brock. Any discussion? Let's have a roll call. Councilmember Parra? Yes. Councilmember Davis? Yes. Councilmember Negrete? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McCowan? Yes. Councilmember Brock? Yes. Councilmember De La Torre? 
Um, is he gone? Okay. Yes, he's gone. Okay. And Mary Helmer Rich. Uh, yes, so that passes uh, six, to six to zero, zero. with one absent. Um, and that ends that item, huh? Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Captain. Thank you, Chief. Okay, next we have 8A is progress update and discussion on revisions to six cycle housing element update and modification of professional services agreement with Wood LLC to provide additional scope of work for the housing element EIR. Give me an hour behind. Hour? Yeah. Um, it's not quite. I might, it may be open already. It's supposed to be an hour. Good evening, um, Mayor and Council. Um, Jing Yo uh, here to provide an update um, on the housing element. Um, just to give you a sense of where we're at in the timeline, uh, this is really sort of a high level uh, progress update. We will be back to Council um, at this point, anticipated in June, with um, additional details as a response to HCD comments. Um, so, the purpose of tonight's meeting is uh, for the council to receive an update as to where we're at um, in our consultations with HCD, provide you more information um, in terms of what it means to be out of compliance, go through some key deadlines. Um, there is a, another action to approve a contract modification to the EIR because revisions are necessary and we'll explain why. Um, and then third, we're looking for direction from the council to direct the city manager to prepare um, an advocacy letter uh, for legislative changes um, to request extra time to complete the housing element rezoning process. Um, so just as a background, as a reminder of where, where we've been, um, RENA, I think everyone knows what the RENA is at this point. Um, Santa Monica's is 8,895 units, and the purpose of the RENA is to demonstrate that we have the zoning capacity to accommodate um, those units. You know, it doesn't mean the city has to build all of them, you just have to demonstrate that you have the capacity to, to accommodate those. Um, the adopted housing element studied 11,070 units. That's what we studied in the EIR. Um, of that number, about 9,000 uh, were affordable. Um, so those are all above our actual reallocation. Um, and that is um, a guideline um, that, that HGD sets that every city you know, plan with that buffer in mind. Um, of those 11,000 units, 1,884 units were designated as uh, affordable units on city-owned sites. Um, and the timeline of, of where we've been, October 12th was when council adopted the housing element. We transmitted it to HCD on November 10th for the 90 day review period. Um, the city received the comments on February the 8th, 2022. That was the um, time that the city was notified that our housing element needs revisions and the city is formally determined to be out of compliance. Um, so the, 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 the key deadlines that October 15th, 2021 Deadline, that's the first statutory deadline. That is a deadline by which all uh, cities in SCAG were required to have adopted a compliant housing element. And compliant housing element, it's not that we decide it's compliant, it's HCD decides it's compliant. So HCD's position is that they had to have certified the housing element before council adopted it. Um, for a variety of reasons, there wasn't really even time to get to that point, but that is HCD's position. Um, there is an extra 120 days within the statute uh, to allow cities to continue to, adopt, you know, to, to have extra time to adopt that compliant housing element. And that was for the purpose of avoiding updating the housing element every four years. Um, that provision was changed by Assembly Bill 1398 that took effect on January 1, 2022. So it changed that four-year requirement to a requirement to rezone to accommodate the RENA by October 15, 2022. So one year from the statutory deadline. So that's a change that sort of you know, took effect after we'd already um, been in this process. So what does it mean to be out of compliance? Um, there are some immediate consequences. The city is out of compliance right now. So uh, one is that there is an obligation to approve any housing project that includes 20% on-site units affordable to lower income households. So that's basically um, up to 60% um, AMI um, or the project consists of 100% moderate units and it's even if that project exceeds uh, existing zoning or general plan maximums. 
So as long as that project includes 20% affordable or 100% moderate, we are obligated to approve that project. Um, any conditions the city uh, puts on that project cannot render it infeasible. Um, so that is a remedy that was added um, in a lot of the changes in housing animal law in recent years. Um, and it was intended to be um, a way to spur production, even if a city hadn't you know, finish its housing element or completed implementation. Um, another key consequence is that the city has lost access to funding. By being out of compliance on the housing element, there are actually two funding sources the city has historically accessed. Um, one is um, a, a pot of money um, that uh, funds affordable housing. Well, they, they both fund affordable housing. One is the local housing uh, trust fund and the other one is the permanent local housing allocation. And that's to the tune of roughly um, it's about $3.3 .3 million over five years, about five to $700,000 a year. And that's um, uh, uh, awarded you know, as the city requests it. And then the other one, the local housing uh, trust fund is one that the city um, has been awarded um, $5 million over 2020 and 2021. Um, it is unknown in 2022 whether we would be eligible because we're out of compliance. So this has very, very real impacts um, on the city's ability to uh, produce affordable housing that we've always historically done. Um, as I indicated, the rezoning for the arena has to be completed by October 15, 2022. That means that there is a deadline to complete zoning changes um, even before the housing element is done. So the policy may not be all finalized yet, but that's a deadline that is um, in the statute right now um, is October 15, 2022. Um, if the rezoning is not completed, um, this is further down the line. So this is October 15, 2022. If we don't complete that rezoning, then the city must approve any projects on the suitable sites inventory uh, that meet the densities um, in the table. Um, we actually had a further, we've been seeking further clarification on, from HCD on this. Um, the, the language is um, you know, not super clear, but I think the, it's probably more important to understand the concept, you know, that it adds um, another obligation for the city to approve projects. Um, on these sites that are slated uh, for rezoning. And then in addition to all of this, you know, while the city is out of compliance, the state can start enforcement proceedings against the city. Um, they can seek judicial relief. Um, you know, certainly it, it opens up the city to um, that possibility. Um, so that's, you know, what, wh where we're in right now in this uh, immediate term where we are currently out of compliance. In terms of over the long term, um, you know, let's say we get into compliance um, Long-term monitoring, you know, one of the big ones is SB 35. Um, that's something the city really hasn't um, been subject to because we, we had a compliant fifth cycle housing element. We were producing housing for our prorated arena. So we were on the list that wasn't subject to SB 35. But um, come um, the annual progress report next year, so starting April 1, 2023, um, and every year thereafter, um, HCD monitors, you know, how cities are producing. So they're looking at building permits issued relative to your prorated arena over eight years. And they're looking at, are you producing enough, um, are you issuing enough building permits for the moderate, uh, for, for the above moderate arena? And are you issuing um, enough building permits for the lower income arena? And if you're not meeting um, either of those targets, you know, then you can see there are two possible um, pathways that uh, an applicant could opt into. And both of them include a streamlined process. What that means is there's no public hearing required for housing projects um, with at least 10% affordability if that above moderate arena is not met, so any market rate building permits are not met. And then for the lower income arena, projects that have 50% um, affordability. Um, there's a host of other preconditions that have been met for SB 35, you know, but that's sort of the general idea. Um, I didn't include another one here, which is something called no net loss, and we've talked about it before in the housing element. Um, that actually has, uh, it, it is quite important and it speaks to why we need to plan for more than our arena. Um, and the, the whole concept is that for every minute over the next you know, eight years, um, the city must be compliant. So you have to demonstrate that you can accommodate your arena and then some for every moment. So it's not a good idea to plan for only 8,895 units because if a project is approved that is lower you know, than what you said in your SSI table, you gotta find that capacity somewhere else. You know, or if on a city owned site, we have less you know, units that are built there than what we said in the SSI, you have to make that up somewhere else. So that's why, that, that's a big reason why, um, you know, we, uh, the, the adopted housing element plan for 11,000 units. And I'll explain in a moment, you know, why it's gotten um, higher based on HGD's comments. Um, these are only selected highlights, you know, it doesn't mean that, as I indicated, the state 
has the right to seek uh, judicial relief and impose penalties and fines um, if, if the city continues to be out of compliance. Um, so over the last, um, ever since we got that letter on February the 8th, we've had probably six, seven, maybe six to eight calls um, with HCD staff, um, really seeking clarification on the comments. Um, you know, if you see in the letter, um, it's, you know, kind of tells you you're out of compliance. It's not particularly specific on how you achieve that compliance. So a lot of these calls have been just trying to understand what is meant by the comment, how, you know, what do we have to do to fully address um, the comment that's being made. Um, and we're highlighting kind of three buckets, I guess, those comments fall into, you know, that are relevant for the overall planning of the housing element. One is um, the city-owned sites, you know, the ability to use those city-owned sites for capacity. Um, as you heard me say, we have 1,884 units that we said are going to accommodate, um, 1,884 affordable units are going to be accommodated on city-owned sites. And so HCD's comment was, well, prove it, you know, demonstrate that commitment. You know, they were not seeing that commitment in the language. Right, so that was one area. They also commented on affirmatively furthering fair housing. This is a brand new requirement for the six cycle housing element. I will say we are not the only jurisdiction by any means struggling with <laughs> trying to understand um, how to achieve this. Um, and th this is one where the, there is a lot of work, I'll just be frank, um, you know, in our discussions with, with HGD. Um, there is, um, it's one we're just gonna have to kind of back and forth and muddle through. Um, there is a particular focus on the R1 zones. Um, they're not looking just at higher, highest resource areas, right? It's looking at Santa Monica at a micro level and using local knowledge, understanding historic patterns within the city of Santa Monica as opposed to the region as a whole. Um, and then finally, um, the third point is, this is sort of the more technical wonky side of, of the housing element. Um, it's really sort of the, the, what I call the math exercises, you know, to demonstrate um, you know, how is the city um, showing that we're accommodating the shortfall of sites? So this is what they call, um, you know, what sites are you using to accommodate your lower income RENA? You know, that, that shortfall that you have existing um, and addressing constraints to housing production. So that's a lot of the, the meat of the work, um, you know, that the staff is working on right now. And it, and it does take a lot of time because it involves going back, analyzing, reanalyzing data, redoing the table um, and, and all that sort of thing. Um, so moving into city on sites, um, so this is, th these are the sites that are included in the adopted housing element right now. So they include the pending project at parking structure three. Um, there are parking lots, surface parking lots on Wilshire on either side um, that are sort of packaged up as, as one. Um, the fourth and Arizona site, um, the Bergamot Arts Center, and then the, what we call the Main Street parking lots. They're not actually on Main Street, they're more on Nielsen Way or the parking lots behind Main Street. Um, and so all of those have been identified in the housing element as uh, city-owned sites, you know, that can accommodate um, affordable housing. And you can see there that the constraints that are listed, right, not all of them are immediately available, um, you know, so that is accounted for um, in the housing element. Um, HCD's comment was that they didn't see enough commitment, you know, in terms of how um, the city would actually bring uh, affordable housing to those sites, things that are with our in that are within our control. So in discussions with HCD, this is sort of the concepts on a potential revised program that they preliminarily said would work, which is to commit to a minimum number of units on city owned sites, you know, so maybe commit to that minimum of 1884, commit to issue RFPs on a city owned sites on a regular schedule. So it's not enough to say that we'll issue one RFP by next year. They wanna see it 2023, 2025, 2027, you know, every, like regular and routine schedule, you know, so that it's something that they will monitor over time that the city's actually doing that. Um, they want us to explain the process that the city pursues to develop city-owned sites. So fortunately, there is quite a history of that in Santa Monica. This wouldn't be new. Um, identifying any potential partners for housing and a list of tools that the city has used in the past to facilitate affordable housing on public land. Um, in the city's history, we have um, produced probably about 700 odd units um, of 100% affordable housing on city-owned land, and we've used a variety of tools um, to, to do that, you know, up, including leveraging um, the city's own local dollars, um, subsidized rent, you know, and, and the like. Um, those are the kinds of tools that, that have been used and will probably seek to continue to do. Um, on affirmatively furthering for housing, um, as you recall, the adopted program uh, in the housing element spoke to incentivizing uh, one additional ADU um, in the R1 zones. And then um, as we discussed in our SB9 study session, council gave direction to implement SB9 
um, and incentivize it strongly um, in some of the larger lots. So that's kind of generally what we heard from the council. We talked about that with HCD and um, you know they basically said that's not enough um, to fully address the AFFH requirement. Um, and this is a case maybe, you know, there was, there's a lot of information in our housing element about um, historic patterns, you know, of where housing's been located, where um, number of housing units, um, disparities in um, demographics and, and the like. So, you know, we're going through an exercise of tabulating existing units, demographics, you know, comparing it to projected. They basically wanna see that delta. What difference are you making? You know, where are you committing to introduce housing where you haven't seen it before? You know, what are you doing to incentivize it in, in areas, you know, that have, that have not accommodated their, their fair share of housing. So, um, you know, S Santa Monica has a bit of a challenge in this regard. So we can't rely on that TCAC high, high resource map, right? Um, like they, they asked us to look at the city of Long Beach, which is what we mentioned um, in, 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 in the report. And, you know, some cities have significant disparities, existing disparities in terms of low, moderate, and high resource areas. So, you know, in some ways it's, it's a little more straightforward in how you address that in a, in a place like Santa Monica where it's very homogenous, at least on a TCAC level, you know, where the whole city is either highest or high resource, HCD is placing a greater emphasis on local knowledge and local factors. Um, you know, so looking at Santa Monica as a whole and seeing that even within our highest and high resource areas, you can look at within the city and see that there are dis, you know, existing disparities in various areas of the city. We, we have one area of the city that is a racially concentrated area of affluence, um, for example, you know, and they would like to understand what is, what are we going to propose um, to uh, overcome those historic patterns? What are you going to do to um, introduce um, new choices, new affordability in areas where it hasn't existed before? They're specifically looking for metrics to incentivize housing choice and affordability. Um, and I, again, I think there is definitely an emphasis in our wind zone neighborhoods. They're also looking for a mid-cycle review, so an opportunity to assess, you know, how the city is progressing um, in uh, achieving those metrics. So this is not something we have anything fully formed on how to proceed at this moment. Um, you know, we do need further consultation on, you know, sort of different ideas um, with HCD staff and we'll return to council at a later date. Um, with some different options, you know, that, that you can consider. Um, and then finally, um, the shortfall of sites to accommodate uh, low-income units. So um, this is really um, getting at the language that is in programs 1F and 1J. This was basically the meat of the rezoning. Um, and, you know, basically their comments were that it wasn't, you know, sufficient to just mention the potential zoning changes. So they really want to see a connection you know, between the zoning changes that you're making, how many units is it going to result in, how much land is being rezoned, um, you know, a connection of that with the suitable sites inventory. So we probably have to work with some, rework some of the language there that has the range of the FARs and the ability to adjust up and down, um, you know, probably needs to be revised um, to have a more specific connection to the SSI because you need to be able to demonstrate that you're actually gonna achieve that shortfall in some way and not you know, go below um, you know, what's been established. So um, you know, that's also an area where we're gonna to continue to work on it you know, and we'll return with, with more details um, on that. Um, so that's kind of the, you know, where, where we've been with, with the consultations with HCD. Um, with the uh, EIR, um, because of the need to study more units, um, this part of the action tonight is a modification to the agreement um, about $231,000 for additional analysis. And it's necessary to revise, revise the ER to account for more housing units in response to HCD comments. So, you know, why revisions to the ER are necessary? Um, addressing the comments um, basically results in an increase in the overall number of potential housing units that need to be studied. The reason for that is really two main factors. One is that since we submitted that in September, we've had a lot of housing projects that have been submitted actually, you know, that now fall into the pending project bucket. So we had to pull those projects that were sitting on our SSI. You know, if you can imagine the land gets less, right? So you're taking those out of play, you know, and so those are now reflecting um, uh, numbers that the applicant is proposing as opposed to what is in the theoretical table. So by the loss of the units, especially the loss of affordable units, you know, the theoretical affordable units in the table, they need to be made up elsewhere. 
Um, and uh, the other one is that we were asked to basically do a 15% haircut across the board for capacity on the entire SSI on every site. Um, and that was to account for the potential that sites might develop into 100% commercial projects um, instead of housing because our zoning is such that we don't prohibit commercial outright, um, nor would we recommend that you know you, you do that, but um, that there's strong incentives for housing. But HGD said in order to um, demonstrate the realistic capacity, you, you can't take full credit you know, for um, the zone capacity of the site. Um, and so just accounting for those two factors, we think that just on some, some very early back of napkin stuff, we think that we need to study somewhere around up to 13,000 units. Um, if the city-owned sites for some reason can't be used or if one of the city-owned sites drops, um, you know, from being allowed to be used, you know, we would need to increase to well over 13,000 units. Um, so for the EIR, I think to be able to cover us, you know, for that eventuality, we probably will be studying more than 13,000 units um, just so that we don't have to come back and do this again, <laughs> um, you know, in case, um, you know, HCD determines that, you know, something needs to be revised with respect to the city owned site. So um, that's why, you know, we do, we do need to modify the ER. There's not really a way um, around that. Um, and this is just a sort of conceptual diagram to help you understand, you know, this it's really the concept of units and land. So there's the 11,000 units that we started with, about 9,000 are allocated and uh, as affordable units. And the way that you allocate the units to sites is that, you know, you either determine that, you know, of those, let's say 80 units, you know, for this site, I'm going to say all of them are affordable, you know, but for this other site, maybe it's only 15% are affordable and the rest are market rate. So it kind of, you know, you, you can't take credit for all of them as, as affordable, right? Because you need to reflect some reality in there of what's happening. And then because we had to remove sites with pending projects, you get a smaller, the, the amount of land grows smaller, but the balloon of units stays the same. And then, you know, when we need to study even more units, you know, the units get bigger, the land is less, you know, and so again, because of that math on the affordable and, you know, how we account for the affordable units for each site, um, you need to increase the overall number of units to make up for that loss um, across the board. So that's just kind of diagrammatically, you know, how that, what that means. So uh, with that, that is the uh, recommendation um, is to approve the contract modification um, receive this update, have discussion regarding the update that you just received if you like. And, um, you know, given all of this, um, we'd also seek the council's direction to the city manager to prepare um, a letter advocating for legislative changes, um, basically asking for more time for an additional six months uh, to complete that October 15, 2022 rezoning. The reasons being is that in order to do the EIR properly, um, you know, we've, we haven't, to, tonight we're, we're just authorizing the contract. We need to get started on it. Our ability to get all of that done, authorized before October 15th will be challenging. Um, and it also allows us to complete the housing element process or so the policy first, get that completed and certified, and then move on to the implementation, to the zoning aspect. Otherwise, in order to meet that deadline, we're gonna be forced to take policy and implementation together, which was, I think, where we, you know, originally, that was our original plan when we were adopting the housing element, but that could potentially put us back in the same situation we're in right now, uh, where we have an out of compliance policy document and you know we were sort of half baked on zoning changes. It's not ver a very sensible way to proceed. You know, we certainly don't want to be in a position of rezoning twice, um, you know, taking zoning changes once and then doing another one two months later, you know, because the rules change. So, um, you know, we're really looking for um, direction to be able to prepare those advocacy letters um, to ask for more time to complete the rezoning. You mean you're looking for us to vote, not for direction. You're gonna write, right? In other words, yeah. you want, uh, right, yeah. okay. Right. So um, I, I have a couple questions and I don't usually take the privilege of going first, but this time I am. So um, can we go back a, a few slides, Jing, to the one where you talk about the penalties for not doing with the 50%, because I, I want that, the forward right. one, forward one. Right. Uh, if lower one. income RENA not meant streamlined process for projects with at least 50% affordability, we have that. Yeah. I mean, that's like no penalty to us at all. We wish, right? Uh, I mean, because basically there are no projects with 50% affordability, right. right? Right, practically speaking, no. <laughs> so that would just achieve what we want, right? 
So then, uh, and, and we've always met our, so on our fifth cycle, have we met everything other than moderate? Yeah, so the difference here is that SB 35 looks at building permits issued, not just approved. So in some ways it is, it is a process that is out of the city's control because we can't tell someone to move faster than they're able to. Right. So that's a distinction. When we, when we report on the APR for the purposes of the Reno, they focus on building permits issued. We also report on projects that are approved so you can see what's coming in the pipeline. But it may be that we approve a bunch of projects, you know, this year, but they didn't get to pull a building permit until. Well, no, and COVID, obviously, with the pandemic, a lot of things didn't get built and the supply shortages. But I just wonder, I mean, so for some jurisdictions, this would be a terrible threat, right? I mean, for, I think for us, the above moderate, we're going to meet it regardless of what we do. I just wonder what the real impact. You know, I, I get what SB 35 does. So there are the penalties, right? There's the daily fine. But, um, but uh, I mean, it would almost be good if they streamlined. I, I, I mean, you know, I hate to say that, but I don't see this is what's so wacky about this because we want to do what they want to do, and yet they're making it so hard for us to do it. And in terms of the Okay, so we did this slide. Now go to affirmatively furthering fair housing. So, so if we did uh, an overlay, an affordable housing overlay, which we had talked about doing, you know, I mean, I actually, is that what they want, to have an affordable housing overlay over the whole city? Um, I think that we, that's a question that, that we need to work through as well because did we ask them that question? We have, and and I think the response we got back was, you know, does the data lead you there? Oh, come on. Like, like, so but what do they really that, want? I, I, I mean, mean, I'm that's just, just such, I'm, I'm just the messenger, but just, <laughs> so they, so they, they're, they're based, you know, what, what we're hearing is that, you know, that, that is a tool, but what is being looked for is uh, metrics, right? Even aspirational ones, you know, so, okay, you've established an AHO. What is it that you hope to achieve with that? Do you hope to achieve, you know, 100 new units over the next eight years? Do you hope to achieve 50? You know, so. Well, they don't, but that's not what they care about. They're just into these numbers right now. So what I'm trying to understand is because if we, let's say we did an affordable housing overlay, it doesn't mean we're going to get any in neighborhoods where land value is so high, right? I mean, that's why we, it seems so stupid at the time. But if they think it's going to make, it may be aspirational, right? But if they think it'll, I would be willing to do an affordable housing overlay over the entire city. Yeah, I mean, I think, because basically you're only going to get what's realistic anyway. What difference does it make? Right. And, and so, I mean, you know, the other uh, concept that has previously been discussed in addition to the HO was this, you know, basically a strategic rezoning of, you know, selected areas of R1 to, to multi-unit. There was, you know, obviously a very strong debate um, and reaction about that. Um, and... You know, debate among us? Yes, yeah, yeah. Basically, we, we never said that. that. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we said we'd be open to it. We excluded historically disenfranchised areas. We included those. No, we excluded Oh, disenfranchised them. areas. Yeah, yeah we right. excluded them from the overlay. Um, but we, but it, it didn't get anywhere because there was like so much there was opposition. Yeah, that's good. What was it? It just didn't account. I mean, it, it, well, yeah, I, we made that argument. But if they're just asking for like paper, like numbers that mean nothing, like well, that's what I'm saying. Day. I mean, you, I don't think you can say it doesn't do anything. They're using it in Cambridge, and there are four projects in the last two years since they've adopted it that have added about 65 or 70, I think, units of affordable housing. Yes, sorry, what I meant, Gleam, is that there are areas in the city where, to Sue's point, they won't actually become anything, even if we project numbers. Because now, I'm not saying that that's right. I'm saying that this, these are assumptions people are making. Like, there's no way they would do that in Santa Monica because the per per square foot price is really so expensive high in Cambridge too. Yeah, and Cambridge prices in Cambridge are high too. My, my point is I think you're kind of jumping and saying, oh, this won't do anything or that won't do anything. And I'm not sure that it necessarily, that the history where the affordable housing overlay has been adopted for some time necessarily shows that. 
Well, you can still, you can think it won't do anything and be willing to do it. Well, if I, I hear think you. it'll do something for their purposes. I think it might even lead to some projects. I don't know. I mean, Good, I'm glad you. Can, what the numbers fun. are that might actually happen. And I don't know if that solves the problem. Well, but so now we're getting into discussion. I, I just was asking questions. Are there any other questions? Because we do have... Although I don't, um, we have two members of the public signed up to speak, and they won't be here. I think they're gone. Yeah, um, okay. Yeah, so want to go? So I know that the projects that are pending, you're saying, to, aren't included. And I don't, I don't understand that. If they're if they're not existing now, and and they're going to exist, well, they're, so they're included. So the difference is, you had a site. That, would, that, had, that had a theoretical capacity. And the really important number isn't just the overall number of units, you know, that could potentially be on a site. It's about how much it's affordable units could be accommodated on there. So let's say we had a site where we made the assumption, because this is what housing element law allows you to do, it allows you to make the assumption that a site has 100% affordable units on there. There would be no other way to demonstrate your low income arena any other way, right? So there's a site that has that, but now, you know, this past January, you know, someone came in and they submitted an actual application for that site. That site is no longer have that theoretical capacity. It has a pending application capacity, which is going to have fewer affordable units, you know, than what we assumed in there. So let's say we assumed 80 affordable units on that site, but the application, because it has inclusionary housing, you know, only had like 15 units in it or something, we have 65 units to make up somewhere else. Um, you know, in in the table. So that's it's, basically how the math works. And the density bonus almost works against the whole purpose because then you get to go higher and you get less well, affordable units. the density units. bonus has always worked against our purposes. Yeah. We had our own density bonus that gave us more affordable units because we had it set up as a tiered system, but they basically undermined it by saying that they override us or not. Would yeah, you say I mean, that's we, accurate? Yeah, it's not, it is not a choice to implement density bonus law. That's state law, so. Yeah. Uh, Christine. And I just had a quick question. I know that, you know, we're, I mean, we have to meet our numbers for Rena, and I know that the state, you know, doesn't really care how we do it. We just have to do it. I mean, that's what it feels like. And so, but I mean, our responsibility is, you know, to our, so this is our community. And so um, our responsibility is to our community. And so for me personally, as we're looking at numbers and trying to figure out how we're going to make this work, you know, I'm trying to also look at it as what, at the end of the day, what is our community going to look like and how is it going to feel for the people that are going to live and work here? And so when I'm looking at affirmatively furthering fair housing, and you also talked about being equitable, right? And so obviously I have to write my notes because I forget everything. But um, when we're looking at that and being more equitable by contracts, how are we protecting the more diverse and, the, and affordable parts of the city like the Pico neighborhood from being densified even further um, or, you know, by, you know, for them, by densified, by how are we protecting them from, from being densified even further or for taking the brunt of the required affordable arena allocations? Like, that's what I'm worried about. So is it all going to end up over here on this side of town? Because that's not okay either. Because we all know that this side of town, you know, is way more affordable than the rest of, of town. And so is it going to, what's going to happen? Are we going to have this like? Yeah, so so that, that actually is the, is the crux of AFFH in Santa Monica on that micro level. Like that's what I was saying, like within the city's borders. Right. Right. If, if you were in, so anywhere in LA County, you would look at Santa Monica and like, you're just a blob, you know, you're just a yeah. big affluent high resource blob, right? But for the purposes of the housing element, we're looking at Santa Monica just within our borders. Mm -hmm. And I think as you're mentioning, you know, and the data, it's supported by data, right? That there is, you know, that, that, that there's differences um, in demographics, there's differences in, you know, densities and number of housing units that are existing. So what they've asked us to do is to like, re we, we've done a lot of that work and created that data mm -hmm. and it's mapping it out and it's showing Here's what's existing, you know, using census data or where we want to use, right? And then compared, like, what is the policy outcome on the other side? So just as an example, you know, if you wanted to say that, you know, there's been too much housing of this type here, you know, like there's, th th this area is the most diverse in the whole city, but this other area is 
not diverse at all, you know, hasn't taken its fair share, right? That That is an AFFH action to say that, you know, we've done a lot here in the past. How do we overcome the pattern so it doesn't continue to repeat that pattern and we incentivize it over here? That 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 is the crux of AFFH, you know, at at the local level is what are you doing Santa Monica to overcome those historic patterns? What are you doing to incentivize housing choice and affordability, you know, in these areas that don't have that choice and affordability now? So, yeah, no, I mean, because those are real concerns for me no, I personally. And I'm going to talk about that mm -hmm. in a, because there are areas north of Montana, right, that um, so there's the areas around Roosevelt that already are multifamily that could be expanded, right? I mean, they're already the whole area um, east of Lincoln, right? There's a lot of multifamily there before you get it north, right? But but then Roosevelt, the area there goes up, I think, two blocks, right, multifamily. 14th Street, where I live, is actually all single family, but is a big enough street that it probably could accommodate it, right? Could accommodate some multifamily, as could um, 26th Street, right? I mean, if you want to look at areas that could accommodate it, I mean, and San Vicente, there are buildings on San Vicente, and it could have more buildings because there are bigger lots there. But then the other thing is that the Palisades tract, where the biggest lots are, right, that area like, you know, Alta, Margarita, you know, Georgina, they have 15,000 square foot lots there and single family homes. So there are areas that could accommodate apartments, right? Um, now, those lots, those homes go for 15 million bucks. I mean, uh, you know, not really. I have to say, I just looked at it. But, uh, but that's a problem. Nobody's going to spend that to, for a lot. So, uh, yeah, but but still, if it would help in this, right, I mean, I don't see a problem with designating those areas for affordable housing, even though I know and you know no, it's no. not going to solve your problem. It's never going to get built. But anyway, Lana. Sorry, I didn't ask this earlier. Um, what part of, like, taking into account what the financial impact on the city and the residents in terms of police, more fire, Roads. I mean, all the traffic impacts, and with that comes people picking up your trash service and water and everything that goes into it. I don't ever see a lot of that being discussed, and I wonder how not only it impacts the city but and the city's bank account, but the residents end up paying for that in the end as well. Yeah, so the, so, so the analysis of, of impacts, you know, of that nature are analyzed in the EIR in terms of impacts on public service, public utilities. Schools. Schools, yeah, all, all of that is is analyzed in the EIR. Um, you know, I think they'll share when it, the, the, the EIR was previously adopted in October. There's a significant impact across the board, you know, in, in every single category. Um, you know, you don't, th this, is, this is at least double the number of housing units that we studied in the land, land use and circulation element. And what's the expectation to pay for that? Right. So the I was just going to say that, you know, the other, the flip side to this is that, you know, they want you to analyze constraints, right? And constraints include fees and all the things that you say that make sense. But there is, I mean, the, the question is, that I don't know that state law really is focusing on that aspect of who pays for it because they're just focusing on feasibility and constraints on, on building housing. But not on land and yeah, so the, what CEQA does is the disclosure of the impacts. But it what's the point of disclosing it if we don't address it? I mean, ultimately, the people in the middle, the working class, are going to pay the brunt of it and get squeezed out of the neighborhood. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and the purpose of CEQA is, is to disclose those impacts. It's so that the council, as a decision maker, understands, you know, the, the, the full scale of the impacts of the project. Um, what the city attorney is, is saying is, is correct. I mean, that is a that is a comment in the HTD letter. You know, I think we were told, wow, you know, your your guys' fees are among the highest we've ever seen in the state. Like, so, you know, that is on the radar in terms of um, the impact fees that Santa Monica charges. Um, you know, and that is, that is a very particular focus um, of state legislation is how much cities are charging. So, you know, I don't, I don't have an easy answer for that, you know. Um, it is not something that appears to be a consideration, you know, when it comes to housing. That's a bummer. Okay, well, uh, 
Uh, let me just say that I don't think there's much we can do about this tonight, and I think we have to approve the additional EIR, but uh, yeah, Council Member Brock. Well, I, I sort of I echo Lana and, and Christine's um, just despair in this because, you know, we're faced with insurmountable charges that are going to destroy the character of our city. And I'm not sure that there's any relief in sight from the state at all. And that's tragic in some ways. I'm all for affordable housing in our city. Can you put a question in there because we still haven't done our public speaker. Do we have public speakers? Yeah, we have no, two we don't. Of them. Yeah, we don't. No, we don't. Those are not. Those are the two that left early. Well, but we have to call their so, names. Okay. So at any rate, do you? So the question is, even though I think we're all depressed about this, do you see any hope on the on the distant horizon at all? Once we get all this stuff done, the head shakes, no. No. Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> yeah, it's really I, I can't read the mind of legislators. Um, you know, I think that the third recommendation tonight is, you know, what, what, what can we do given this situation is, is really ask for time, you know, just to be able to proceed in, in a sensible way through this. Um, you know, I, I think as you heard me say, I don't think it's anyone's interest to attempt to rezone, you know, twice in the next year, you know, this, this allows us just the time to complete the work, get the policy done, get it certified, and then proceed into zoning. And that's, you know, really the path that we would like to pursue. Well, so let me ask you a, a different question because West Hollywood is basically doing nothing, right? I mean, I assume you've talked to them. They've just said to HCD, you don't understand, go away. Pasadena is pushing, I mean, the, the good actors are, are being put in such a difficult position. So do you think, well, anyway, I, I think that, um, but we all understand that. But uh, but people are deciding not to rezone. I mean, and when you come, to, maybe we'll have more resolution of this. But I'm not ready to jump to rezone under these circumstances where it's completely nothing's acceptable anyway, right? Yeah, I think that's our concern is that proceeding with a path of rezoning right now, it feels like you're chasing a moving target. That's right. You know, and, and, and I think that is, that's, that. that I mean, we gave it a great is, shot. Yeah, this with is very, on. very tough, tedious work, and we just, we don't need to be doing tables over tables. So, you know, that's, I think the time is what Thank we're you. simple after. Uh, yes. So, um, can I get a motion? Um, I, I'm sorry, but. I, yeah, we do. You're right. Keith Robinson. I, I know, but uh, their names are on the list. They put their names in, and so I feel like we should call them Devon Harris. Uh, and I don't think they're here. So now let me call for the motion um, to authorize the city manager to negotiate and execute a second modification to agreement number 11112 in the amount of $213,041 and extend the term by one additional year with Wood LLC, a professional environmental consulting company, to provide additional environmental consulting services, resulting in a three-year amended agreement with a new total amount not to exceed $580,427. So moved. Moved by... Mayor Pro Tem McCowan, seconded by what? Other way around. Oh, by Davis McCowan. Okay, Davis McCowan. Sorry, moved by Davis, seconded by McCowan. May we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember De La Torre. Yes. Councilmember Brock. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McCowan. Yes. Councilmember Negrete. Yes. Councilmember Davis. Yes. Councilmember Para. Yes. Mayor Helmrich. Yes, yeah, so that passes seven to zero. And now um, we did receive an update. Call for a motion to receive an update on the status of responses to comments on the adopted six circle, six cycle housing element update and direct the city manager to submit a letter advocating for legislative changes to provide for additional time beyond October 15th, 2022 to complete rezoning. Motion? I move. Oh, move by Brock. Sorry. Seconded by Negretti. Let's have a roll call vote. <laughs> Hold on a second. It's the other way around, right? 
Yeah. Brock Negretti, yeah. Oh. All right. Councilmember Parra. Yes. Councilmember Davis. Yes. Councilmember Negrete. Yes. Mayor Potem McCowan. Yes. Councilmember Brock. Yes. Councilmember De La Torre. Yes. And Mayor Hilma Rich. Yes. So that passes seven to zero and it is 11 o'clock. Does anyone want to stop now? No, we have to move. And this is where we need our motion to go past 11, right? Yes. Yes, to hear any new items. I'll move that we continue and finish the session. Second. Moved by Brock, seconded by McCowan. Uh, can we do this by uh, acclamation? Yes. Okay, does anyone object? Seeing no objections, Inside. it's approved. Inside. We go past 11 and let's move on to 9A. I don't know. What's the third one? No, it was okay. rolled into the second oh, okay. one. Can we bring that back if it goes past? The, the letter I mean, is rolled into number oh, okay. two. Yeah, check it. Hold on, I may have it open already. Oh. Somebody needs Get to it? talk with the guy who does the fine print. <laughs> right. Okay, item 9A is the public hearing and adoption of resolution ordering vacation of public right of way on 21st Street between oh, Santa oh. Monica. Boulevard okay. and Broadway. Can I take my car keys too? Or no. Just, oh, okay. No. Sorry um, about that. We have, uh, so because she needs to go out of the room because she's recused from this matter. But uh, now you're up. <laughs> uh, good evening, Mayor Council. I'm Alex Nezertrick, your uh, city engineer from the Public Works Department. I'm here Tell me to your last name again. I'm sorry. Uh, Nezertrick. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm here tonight to quickly summarize the staff report for the 21st Street Vacation Public Hearing and answer any questions you may have. My presentation will be in the following order. Uh, on March 22nd of this year, Council took uh, first steps towards the proposed street vacation request from Providence. Uh, council declared its uh, intention to vacate the street and scheduled the public hearing tonight. Uh, council also adopted the third amendment to the development agreement and approved the Providence Phase Two Master Plan, which contemplates a partial vacation of 21st Street between Santa Monica Boulevard and Broadway. So diving into the details, uh, Providence requested the city vacate the northerly 250 feet of 21st Street between Broadway and Santa Monica, which is the area shown in blue on, on the screen. Uh, Providence owns properties on both sides of 21st Street in the vacation requested area. The street was initially dedicated to the city as an easement for street purposes and to provide access for public utilities. and. Um, the development in this proposed vacation area creates an opportunity for a pedestrian-oriented, publicly accessible plaza. The plaza would open onto Santa Monica Boulevard and provide public access for pedestrians through the Providence campus all the way to Broadway. Today, 21st Street is a one-way southbound street. Uh, it would be converted to a northbound street with, with proposed circulation through two new city streets as shown in black and red. Uh, the area in red is a proposed north-south street, tentatively named 20th Place, which is located between 20th and 21st Street. And the area in black is a new westbound one-way street, tentatively named St. John's Way, connecting 21st Street to 20th Place. So the southern portion of um, 21st Street would remain a public street and continue to provide access to neighboring residential developments and connect the two new city streets, the ones shown in red and black. So public outreach was done in accordance with the California Streets and Highway Code. Uh, in addition, utility companies were notified as well. Four utility companies um, notified the city and requested reservations, uh, meaning the areas, um, their utilities, um, meaning the utilities would remain in place with easement rights um, if they were not relocated by Providence. So such companies like Frontier and Charter Spectrum, they both have underground and overhead utility lines in the street vacation areas and SoCal Edison and SoCal Gas have both uh, electrical and gas facilities pipelines in the street as well. Uh, and this is in addition to city owned water, wastewater and street lighting infrastructure, which is also in the street vacation area. Um, 
So staff anticipates that the utility relocations would be necessary and Providence would work with the, would work on relocating the utilities uh, prior to the street vacation taking place. Um, so the requests from the utility companies need to be considered and be made part of the condition of the vacation. So uh, California law allows the city to vacate a public street after a public noticing and a hearing is held, also based on the findings that uh, public street is not needed in the future. So staff recommends that city council find that the 250 feet, 250 feet of a northern portion of 21st Street is unnecessary for future public use, but only given that certain condition be satisfied before the street uh, vacation becomes effective, as stated in the Third Amendment to the development agreement with Providence. So what this means is the street vacation would not occur until all the conditions on the screen have been met, which would happen within the future construction by Providence occurring in phases during the 17 year vesting period. And Providence would also phase the construction work and maintain access to the three residential properties on 21st Street. Um, this concludes my presentation. I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Uh, and the recommended action items on your screen. Um, uh, I'm not seeing any, I have one quick question. So the naming of the streets. Um, do we decide that? Who decides that? Um, good question. <laughs> if uh, I'm thinking that well, the reason I'm asking is because uh, I just wonder if we should be thinking about naming sh streets in memory or in honor of, I mean, if it's such a short street. But so uh, that's why I'm asking who names the streets. But we don't have to do that now, right? No, no, we don't. Okay, good, because I, I would like to think about starting to do have 16 years or so. <laughs> <laughs> what, 15 years? 16. It's a 17-year vesting period, so, I mean, theoretically, they could take that long before the street is actually vacated, so you have a while. I mean, it could happen earlier, but... And since we only name after dead people, all of us could be dead by then. <laughs> so... <laughs> be optimistic <Right>. now. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> right, exactly. That's what, anyway, no, but yeah, I'm not. I'm just saying, I wondered about naming them because, you know, numbers are fine, but names are more interesting. Um, seeing no um, questions, uh, may I have a motion to approve the proposed partial vacation with conditions of 21st Street, but are you listening? of 21st Street between Santa Monica Boulevard and Broadway for the Public Works Department. No moved. Moved, oh. Uh, okay, moved by Davis, seconded by McCowan. May we have a roll call vote? Councilmember De La Torre? Yes. Councilmember Brock? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McCowan? Yes. Councilmember Davis? Yes. Councilmember Parra? Yes. And Mayor Hamelrich? Yes, so that passes six to zero. Now may I have a motion uh, to, hold on, uh, to confirm the determination that the environmental impacts of the vacated with conditions of a portion, uh, this doesn't make sense. I need a motion that there are no environmental impacts uh, of the vacation of uh, portion of 21st Street with conditions directly adjacent to the Providence St. John's campus. They were analyzed in the final environmental impact report certified by City Council on March 22nd, 2022. But let me say that differently. So that uh, we need to determine that the envir impacts of the vacation of this street were analyzed in the final EIR certified by us on March 22nd, 2022. So may I have that motion? Uh, moved by Para. May I have a second? second? Seconded by McCowan. May we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Para. Yes. Councilmember Davis. Yes. Councilmember, I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Tem McCowan. Yes. Councilmember Brock. Yes. Councilmember De La Torre. Yes. And Mayor Hamelrich. Yes. 
And now may I have a motion to adopt the resolution vacating, vacating a portion of 21st Street between Santa Monica Boulevard and Broadway. Motion moved by Parra. Just to be clear, with conditions. Pardon me? With conditions. Oh, to, oh good. With conditions. Sorry. I'll second. Uh, seconded by Brock, Parra and Brock. And let's have a roll call vote. Councilmember De La Torre. Yes. Councilmember Brock. Yes. Rapporteur Tim McCallum. Yes. Councilmember Davis. Yes. Councilmember Parra. Yes. And Mary Hemelrich. Yes. So that passes six to zero. And you can come back. Yeah. Come on. Uh, and I'm calling Councilmember Negretti back. And will you call the next item, please, Madam Clerk? The next item is uh, 9B, and it's the public hearing and adoption of resolution for the 2022 annual water shortage assessment report. And we do have one speaker for this item. Um, so we'll hear. Yeah, Ms. Barton after the staff report. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council members. I'm Sonny Wang, the city's water resources manager within the Public Works Department. I'm here tonight to provide a summary of the annual water shortage assessment report. Uh, this is a new requirement under the California Water Code as part of the 2020 Urban Water Management Plan that was adopted last June. The procedures of the report is outlined in the Water Shortage Contingency Plan that was also adopted last June. Um, it includes a presentation to the Commission on Sustainability, Environmental Justice, and the Environment, which was done in February, and also to hold a public hearing for this annual assessment, which is taking place right now. Uh, the annual water shortage assessment report is due each year by July 1st to the California Department of Water Resources, and it requires formal adoption by City Council. However, with the most recent executive order that the governor has put out, we are required to submit this by June 1st now because of the ongoing drought conditions in California. Uh, just a summary is to start with the water demand assessment. As part of the assessment, we do look at the history to look at actual demand versus projected in order to make uh, the projected demand for the next year. So we looked at 2015, 2019, as well as 2020, 2021. The reason why we split up those time periods is because of the COVID pandemic, you do see our average annual demand actually decrease by uh, 10, 15% or so. That's primarily from the commercial industrial sectors in the city where we saw that water um, demand go down. However, single family, multifamily, those demand are actually pretty consistent during that time. So we take a look at the history as well as looking at the protect, projected population increase to project our annual demand for the upcoming year, uh, which is about 11,779 acre foot. So we're actually returning to pre-pandemic levels in our water demand projections. The next number you see is the projected unconstrained demand. So DWR also asked us to project that if we didn't have any conservation measures in place, what that demand would look like. So that's without the stage two water shortage targets and conservation efforts we have already implemented and the city has been in that stage two since 2014 so that has contributed a lot to our ability to meet our current demand by having that permanent water reduction in place next we look at the available supply um, this is a combination of the importer supply that we buy from metropolitan water district we only consider our tier one allocation we could push into tier two but for this assessment uh, we typically try to stay within Tier 1. We haven't pushed into Tier 2 for quite some time now, ever since we restored the Sharnock well field. Uh, we also look at our local supplies as estimated in our 2020 Urban Water Management Plan. We also do factor in other conditions such, such as shutdowns in our Arcata Water Treatment Plant. As many of you know, we broke ground on the expansion of that treatment plant. There are expected shutdowns this year to uh, facilitate the construction, so we will lose some of that local production. We have taken that out of our supply equation as well. Um, so the available water supply we have is about 12,707 acre feet. Uh, so just do that balance, we have um, ample supply to meet the projected water demand. However, we do highlight the unconstrained demand, how important water conservation and water use efficiency is to remain in that stage two water shortage um, stage in our city to maintain those conservation efforts. Uh, so we recommend in remaining in the stage two water shortage condition to reduce 20% water. Uh, we want to continue to implement those actions in the stage two water shortage response actions that's outlined in our water shortage contingency plan that also aligned with the latest, uh, sorry, latest executive order as well from the governor asking 
on municipalities to be in stage two. So we've already there. We've been there since 2014. Um, at this time, I also like to thank our residents um, for doing their part in, re in conserving water and helping us maintain at those levels. Um, the last recommendation is to adopt the 2022 annual water shortage assessment report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wang. Another great report. Um, now, uh, okay, uh, Ms. Barton, you are only public speaker. Good evening. On the water shortage, shortage assessment, I do have a question. Is it contradictory for the state who says we're in a drought to demand through the arena almost 9,000 new units to be built, which equals over 1,000 new units per every square mile of the city? Unless, of course, the real point is to drive up water rates due to demand. Hmm, I wonder if Gavin Newsom holds stock in entities that control and disperse the state's water. Not that it would surprise me considering how his Aunt Nancy Pelosi and her husband do seem to profit off insider trading. And on the subject of high water rates, didn't the city align its billing rates with the DWP at one point? So imagine my surprise when you last raised the water rates in 2020 by 100% in five years, when again in 2019, the DWP was found to be overcharging customers for water like they did in 2014. Also, I hope everyone remembers the city's history of low volume estimates in reference to the tables included in the staff report. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barton. Um, so, any questions? Council Member Brock. So, Sonny, just for the public's uh, understanding, uh, if you took a cubic foot of water, okay. it, how, how deep is that and how large an area? Cubic foot? Cubic acre foot. foot. Oh, cubic, cubic acre foot. Sorry. Oh, cubic foot's this. No, cubic <laughs> acre foot. Uh, cubic acre foot is, uh, I forgot how many Olympic size, uh, two or three Olympic size swimming pools. Or a football field two feet deep or two inches deep? Yeah, about, uh, I should remember these statistics better. So you're supposed to know these things. I know, you got so, me tonight. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think it's a football field two feet deep or two inches acre? deep. As I, I think you're asking one acre feet of water. Yeah, how much that is one acre so, foot. So essentially, it's one acre of land of one foot deep. Got it. Uh, that's probably okay. Which I think someone told me place. once when I was at the at the yards, they told me that was the equivalent of a football field. I think it's on a brock in your block, <laughs> but but not not a, that wasn't a, a tip for that. But the only reason I'm asking is because for residents sometimes that becomes confusing. Right. So I wanted to sort of put it into a perspective that everyone could understand. So we use how many acre feet per year in Santa Monica? The projected demand is about 11,700 acre feet. So about 11,700 football fields with a foot of water on it. Still quite a bit of That's a lot of water. Yes. But I, I think, and we do we have an est approximate maximum estimate of our aquifers? In what terms of how think, much we have. Yeah, um, what we think we have in an average year is a, something like fifteen or 16,000 or the, something. The sustainable yield of our basin is the max is at, it's a range. So it goes from about 9,000 to 15,000 in that range. Um, if you look at the. So we're rates, theoretically, if we were pumping it out properly, we could be 100% sustainable right now if we were at maximum yield. If we could extract all that groundwater, yes. And as long as the ground doesn't start sinking. Correct. There are well fields that we don't have wells in either right. um, with that. So there's there's other parts of the equation. But yeah, theoretically, the max amount we could have enough groundwater for our local demand. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions, oh, comments? Uh, may I have a motion? I'll move. <laughs> yeah, OK, good. Uh, move by Brock. Do I hear a second? Second. Move by Brock, seconded by, by De La Torre. May we have a roll call vote, please? Uh, I think uh, we're call, uh, we're adopting the resolution adopting the 2022 annual water shortage assessment report. Okay. Yep. So, uh, whoa. Okay. Uh, let's have a roll call. Councilmember Para. 
Yes. Council Member Davis? Yes. Council Member Negrete? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McCowan? Yes. Council Member Brock? Yes. Council Member De La Torre? Yes. And Mayor Hilmerich? Yes. So that passes seven to zero. Thank you. Next, we have 13A, Council Members Negrete and Parra, that to enhance Latino Hispanic Heritage Month and resident family focus programming on Santa Monica Pier. Council directs staff to one, waive fees associated with the partial use of the parking lot on the Santa Monica Pier to support the annual Santa Monica Classic Car Show on the Santa Monica Pier, tentatively scheduled for September 10th, 2022 from 9 to 5 p.m. Presented by Pico Youth and Family Center. And two, allocate up to $5,000 of council discretionary funds to reimburse Pico Youth and Family Center for documented expenditures to support sound, entertainment, and promotional materials for the event that will be free and open to the public. And you have no speakers on this. And we have we have no request to speak. So um, who wants to introduce this? Is council, did council member- uh, He council walked out on? already. And, and council member De La Torre is recusing because of his relationship, I assume, he should have announced it, but since he didn't, I will announce it because of his relationship with PYFC, although I do have a question about that, but why don't you present it? Um, we had this, it doesn't, I can't believe it's already been as long as it's been <laughs> in here, but um, we had this event on the pier and it was really successful. It was great. Um, lots of people in attendance in the community, <clears throat> um, you know, asking to waive the fees so that we can have this, I think is, Reasonable and um, Pico Youth and Family Center provided um, the sound entertainment and all the promotional materials last time and they will be presenting receipts in order to obtain up to that amount and reimbursement. And so, um, and this is a question for the city attorney because the only thing I'm concerned about is that because of Council Member De La Torre, and I am assuming he doesn't have a present relationship, business relationship with PYFC, and that he doesn't get any money from them because if he did, I'm worried about the 1090 problem. I think we determined that even uh, if we used his last submitted Form 700 and the information on that form, it's still a remote interest, and therefore, if he recused himself, he, you guys could still take the vote. Great. So, um, Council Member Parr, you want to say anything about no, this? No, I'm just happy to support the event, and um, I wasn't able to attend uh, last time, but I did hear that it was a wonderful event and uh, nothing but positive, um, uh, positive feedback um, about the event, and it was a family-friendly event on the pier, and. And uh, I heard from the vendors as well that um, that they also enjoyed it as well. So happy to, to support and be a part of it. And Step so now you're going to move it, right? Yeah. Up, and I would like to move the event. Good. So uh, second. moved by Parra, seconded by Negretti. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's have a roll call. Yeah, can we do these by acclamation? Money. Oh, money. I can always forget about the money. <laughs> Some of them you will be able to, though. Not, this is no, not no, one no, of them. No. Okay. And they're all mine. Council Member Brock. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McCowan. Yes. Council Member Negrete. Yes. Council Member Davis. Yes. Council Member Parra. Yes. And Mayor Hemmerich. Yes. So that passes six to zero. And Council Member Delatore, you can come back. I think there's that's yeah. And uh, next is next is 13B, and it's request of Council Member Brock that the City Council authorize use of his travel funds to attend the 2022 California Contract Cities Association Annual Municipal Seminar, whew, taking place May 12th through the 15th, 2022, in Indian Wells, California. The California Contract Cities Association will be providing a 50% discount on registration, and we have no public speakers on this. Council Member Brock. Um, I, I found it uh, extremely valuable to attend conferences the last couple of months. I, I think I'm learning a lot and I'm doing my best to try and become a good steward of the city. And I think that the, um, 
this participation of this conference uh, will help me in terms of the seminars and things presented there. And uh, the contract cities are providing a 50% discount on registration as well. Let me ask again, how much is it? Uh, th 350 Yeah. for registration. Okay, thanks. Well, yeah, I mean, you, yeah, uh, that's all. I just wanted to know the amount. No, no. It's... Okay, good. Thank you. Um, any questions? Uh, any motion? I have a question. What yeah. Is, what, what if we want to attend? Anybody else? Then you'll have to come and get an individual. Uh, I can add to it? I can leave some add on? Uh, you know, I think the problem is we aren't a contract city. I mean, if you're going to a, something that we aren't a member of, you have to get permission, yeah, because we're, if it were independent cities, we're a member of that, I think, but we are not a member of this because we aren't a contract city. Um, anyway, so, um, uh, so, do I hear a motion? Do I hear a second? Good, moved by um, De La Torre, seconded by Para. Let's have a roll call. Councilmember Para? Yes. Councilmember Davis? Yes. Councilmember Nergette? Yes. Mayor Potem McCowan? Yes. Councilmember Brock? Yes. Councilmember De La Torre? Yes. And Mayor Himmelrich? Yes, so that passes 7 to 0. And now we're 13C. Item 13C is council request of council members Brock and Para that the city manager, as part of the budget study session, that is scheduled for May 24, 2022, provide information on what is needed for staffing technology and any other resources to support hybrid city council and boards and commission meetings that would allow the public to provide public comment both in person and remotely. The city manager is also being asked to provide information on the timeline to transition to hybrid meetings. And we do have a couple of, well, we have a couple of requests to speak on this. Okay, so uh, so I'm going to call the names. So we have Denise Barton, Devon Ray Harris, who I think is not here, Jerry Rubin, who looks like he's gone, and Jonathan Foster, who might be, hall, might be in the hall. So Jonathan, if you're around, you're up. And go ahead, Ms. Barton. Good evening. I support the idea of hybrid meetings. That way, board and commissioner members who feel uncomfortable attending in-person meetings due to COVID have an alternative way to attend without depriving the public of the ability to give input in person. The hybrid meeting model should be open to the members of the public too. That way, if for whatever reason, a community member is unable to attend the in-person meeting, they can still participate. That way, more people can participate in city council and board and commission meetings. And isn't that what you say you want? Although your actions of imposing a 100-person, three-hour comment limit and cutting comments to one minute does negate that. Although, I do support, again, I do support the hybrid meetings for city council and board and commission meetings, as well as for the city manager to come back with information on what is needed in the timeline for it to be put in place at the budget study session on May 24, 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barton. Mr. Foster? Hi, I think I only get one minute. Uh, I support this. Uh, Sorry. It's pretty easy to support. I, I thought about that. Why don't they, you know, go ahead and keep some of that going on. Um, like if you had heart surgery and maybe you were still recovering and four or five days later, uh, city council takes up something you have a stake in, you could actually make the phone call from the hospital. Oh, yeah. So. Kind of cool. <laughs> Um, but also on a 13C item uh, that we are at least on a C item, I have to try to throw in a little bit. Uh, I remember I, Oscar put something on the 13 items about the piece of paper that had your name on it and stuff like that. And I would like to hear the results of what, the, what you asked for on there. So, but this is the easy one. Remotely is kind of neat. I've actually considered and I looked into trying to call the New York City Police Department to comment to them on uh, things that I've seen happening in New York, but uh, I couldn't find a number, but thanks. Thank you. Okay, do I, any discussion? Do I hear a motion? Um, 
I'll move, and I have a question from a resident asking if there's the option of video participation as well for people who might need a, that reasonable accommodation. So could we ask that the staff at least since they're just looking at all this? I think it's um, and I, technology. That's part of the consideration. Oh, technology, yeah, it's there. Um, my, I'll, I'll move that we pass this. Uh, moved by Brock, seconded Make by Para. Easy. May we have a roll call vote? Councilmember De La Torre? Yes. Councilmember Brock? Yes. Mayor Pro Tim McCowan? Yes. Councilmember Negrete? Yes. Councilmember Davis? Yes. Councilmember Para? Yes. And Mayor Kimmelrich? Yes, so that passes 7 to 0. Okay, next we have 13D is request of Mayor Pro Tim McCowan and Council Member Davis that the City Council allocate $25,000 of discretionary funds to Community Corporation of Santa Monica to support the upcoming marketplace at Brunson Terrace, located at 1819 Pico Boulevard, an affordable housing property that will include commercial space for local Pico-based businesses, pop-ups, workshops, and more. The marketplace was created in response to Pico community stakeholders expressing the need for an affordable small business space. And we have no request to speak on this. Um, okay, who's introducing? Um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, so I don't really Is it just building out the space? Is that what it is? Yeah, so yeah. this is more okay. for assistance in building out the, the space that's currently under construction. All right, and it's consistent. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, well, I was just going to say, and it's consistent with our budgetary priorities that we identified about having an inclusive economic recovery because it will give people who otherwise wouldn't have opportunities the ability to sell wares, learn how to run a business, that sort of thing. And the reality is there's, there's, there's really about a $50,000 shortage, um, but the goal was, you know, because we have a lot of things that are in need of discretionary funds that we would be able to, to look at this 25 now and see what options we have in the next fiscal year. Um, but this will help them to get on their way toward a goal that we, we've set. So and have they thing. sought funds from the We Are Santa Monica Fund? I don't believe so. I think it was... I don't believe so. Because this would, uh, it seemed to me, be a perfect use for those sorts of funds. So, and I'm just saying. We can right. send, I can, we can direct them to. Well, you said they're 25 short still. Yeah, yeah, so they can go back and look okay, good. there. But Christine had a question. Yeah. Sorry. No, I just, um, first of all, of course, I support, you know, this type of um, project. But I just have never heard of this project to begin with oh, period it's the big development that's going up at the never heard of it so that's why I wanted more of a backstory okay. like please tell me all about this project oh. this is the first time I've ever even heard the word Brunson Terrace sure. so that's why I wanted a full report this is the big big project that's the affordable housing project that's going up right across the street from SMC right um, now Pico. Yeah. never heard of it right by the uh, Burger King it's a hundred percent affordable housing okay. project CCM is doing it's it's a there were people who were um, temporarily relocated that'll be part of it but also I, I don't I don't recall the exact number of units and in the bottom it's a uh, retail space on one side. It's a, uh, I believe they, they designed it for a coffee shop on one side and a market dynamic market marketplace on the other side with artisanal goods and stuff from local vendors and smaller um, micro, uh, s smaller oh, entrepreneurs yeah. that can like receive micro grants and other things. Like yeah, the commercial can kitchen up. can supply stuff for the, the cafe and other things. And it's just to, create a dynamic space for local entrepreneurs in that area and subsidize, you know, some of the traditional costs so that they can have a, a marketplace. So the construction from CCSM does not include build, build out, out fully of the first floor? So, so this, this isn't floor? about the physical construction right. per se, but it's about sort of 
everything else to get to create the so lighting, space. retail. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's what in the re real estate industry you would call tenant improvements. Got it. It's the interiors. And the retailers who come in wouldn't be able to do that, so we're trying right. to supply right. that Right, it's form. the interior so improvements. Sue's idea sounds good. Can, can it be, can part of this be done by our well, Santa Monica I, fund or I, David's? Not, we, are Santa Monica, we are Santa Monica fund now has its own board, so you'd need to apply for funds. They have a, a formal process. It's not as loosey-goosey as it was during the pandemic. And they can do, they can do that, and that's why when the request came in and it was for 50, I, I felt that 25 was a comfortable place for council discretionary to come in at, and then we would talk about sort of how to support, help them in other ways because we support their project. And, um, and so I think going back to them and talking to them about, um, I don't know the whole process, for submitting for funds from We Are Santa Monica, but, but they, they can, can figure that out. Public, yeah, yeah. private. I they mean, think of the out. other people that think of other groups because this is a perfect yeah. matching fund yeah. project for well, and a, that's a the thing is with this contribution of half of the funds, the they city is showing its support so they can go out into the private market cool. and say, look, we have this level of support from the city, and we have to essentially, you know, make up the other half, whether it's by a you know, private donations, or we are Santa Monica. It's one-time money, which is the good news. <laughs> uh, so do we have a motion? I'll make a motion. Moved by Negretti, seconded by De La Torre. Uh, let's have a roll call vote. Council Member Parra? Yes. Council Member Davis? Yes. Council Member Negrete? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McCowan? Yes. Council Member Brock? Yes. Council Member De La Torre? Yes. And Mary Hilmer Rich. Yes, so that passes seven to zero. Okay, and then our last item is 13E, request of Mayor Pro Tem McCowan and Councilmember Negrete that the City Council approve the one waiving fees associated with partial use of the pier deck parking lot on Thursday, May 26, 2022, from 5 to 8 p.m. for the Rick Crocker 5K Walk Run Challenge sponsored by the Police Activities League. How and two, allocate up to five thousand dollars of discretionary funds to reimburse PAL for document documented expenditures to support sound entertainment and seating for this event, event which will be free and open to the public. And you have no request to speak on this. Introduction. Oh, sorry. Did you want to go ahead? I'll speak. I just want to say that uh, Mr. Uh, Rick Crocker was a very fine. A person, uh, a great police officer, and someone who uh, I, I, I recall, you know, with uh, fond memories, you know, just being a great guy. And um, many, many people know that he uh, he uh, passed away, and in, um, in, in, uh, he was serving, I think, in was it Iraq or Afghanistan? I know he was he was in the military, Iraq, yeah, right. in a tour in Iraq. And uh, anyway, uh, just a, a great, a great example, you know, for our community, and, and so uh, I, I support, you know, making making this happen in, in his memory. So I'd like to move the move. Move by okay, great. Move by De La Torre, seconded by second by Negretti. Let's take a roll call vote. Councilmember De La Torre. Yes. Councilmember Brock. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McCowan? Yes. Council Member Negrete? Yes. Council Member Davis? Yes. Council Member Parra? Yes. And Mayor Helmerich? Yes. So that passes seven to zero. And I guess we're on to public input. Your votes did go through. So oh, and hold I on, just want to thank staff for including in the items the the remaining funds in our discretionary account. Made it. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Nope, that's it. Stephanie. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> okay, so now we have public input. Public comment is permitted only on items not on the agenda that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city. State law prohibits the city council from taking action on any items not listed on the agenda. Yes, it is. Including issues raised under this agenda item. And we have. Four, I see. Yes. Is that right? Four, so yes. this is the order. So first, Laura Wilson, then Denise Barton, 
then Jonathan Foster, and then Elizabeth Lear. And everybody has two minutes each. I see my time. You can start. Thank you. When city council members vote against the interest of the residents of the city, they do not belong in the seats that you sit in. Good evening. I'd like to start bringing up things that are of concern to the people within the city relating to the upcoming election in November and beyond. The thing that seems to be the most important to everyone is the lack of safety and security in the city, which can be seen due to Santa Monica's rating as the fourth most unsafe city in the state. But, but the ones who feel strongest about, the, about it are Mayor Himmel Rich, Mayor Pro Tem McAllen, and Glean Davis, considering on September 8, 2020, they all voted to defund the police and caught all the criminals. Although you have a history of this in relation to the homeless court system as well. And what is in common about all these council members? All of these council members have allegiance alliances to organizations other than the residents, property owners, and businesses within the city. For example, Mayor Himmelrich's allegiance is to Smur, and Krista McCowan and Gleam Davis's allegiance is to Santa Monica Forward. So we'll have to ask ourselves, what benefit does Santa Monica for Renters' Rights and Santa Monica Forward obtain as a result of crime and unrest in the city? So crime and, un and unsafety in our city is what, the pe what is what people from these organizations really want. Is this what is in the best interest of the city, and is it what is it in the interest and in business's best interest to continue putting these people on the city council? I personally don't think so. It's almost like you're putting the fad of being woke ahead of the best interest of the city and its residents. Not to mention the promenade, which for years has been the city's golden goose and the reason you've had funding for your special interests. So why would you now be trying to harm that area by depriving the promenade of adequate safety and security? Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, hello again, Jonathan Foster. I'm going to be looking down at the page, not so much at you. Um, I was thinking about having a, a real, real, real late-term abortion for you seven on the abortion issue. We'll just do it now, not call it murder. It's a real, real late-term abortion. So let's talk about some other things. Uh, with my 
this is this is about Israel. How many people they have killed so Israel can chop off a lamb's head in a building in Jerusalem, right? And and, and this right in in Jerusalem, they're very hostile between themselves. You've seen the videos. I have. I've been you know looking at everything that's going on there, and and I'm just stating my feelings based on what's happened to me on Third Street with the First Amendment issue. That's where this comes from. Because it's nasty. I, I, and I don't hate Jews or Israel. They can come over to my car. It's kind of dirty, but they're welcome. Everybody's up. But they take it as hate. That's their fault. I don't hate them. Right? Separation of church and state present, uh, prevents the tax money. It's not supposed to go to anything like a church where the government mandates your religion. However, everything that's going on supports the, uh, the Holy Land over there. It's a church, a synagogue, actually, and that's wrong. How, how in this country, if I'm not pro-Israel over there, they don't like me here. I'm from here. What do you mean? I get harassed about this because they obstruct my life. Overall, you know, this tax, overall tax revenue supports everything going to Israel. The Constitution does not say that that's what we're about here, Jerusalem. It doesn't say that. That, that if I say that, it's like I, I'm some bad person. I, I'm, I'm for here. I'm, I'm, I'm even part Native American. I'm Choctaw. Helito Jimmy Chocoma. I'm still learning their language. I'm from here. My heart's here. That's where my drumming comes from. Of course I'm Choctaw. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Hi, Elizabeth Lair. I just want to um, bring it to people's attention that this year our rent increases might go from typically 2%, 1.5 to 2%, 6% in September. People aren't aware of this, and I think they should be aware of it. I think the Rent Control Board, the Rent Control Department should be getting this word out. People should be aware. It's going to be a shock. Bill Davids wrote an incredible letter to Rent Control Commission. They didn't they, they could have brought something to the council so that we had some way, the city had some way to address this type of hyperinflation. So these people should be aware of this. There's going to be a rent control commission meeting day after tomorrow, Thursday night. And I think uh, renters should be bringing this up and getting the word out that your rents are going to be shockingly high come September. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any adjournments? I'm so happy we don't. Uh, so uh, this meeting is adjourned. Our next meeting is May 10th. Our next meeting is May 10th, 2022. At, what? No. <laughs> at 5.30. Thank you. Let's take another.